situation in, in, in Paris these days? At the moment, well, it's, it's, uh, getting, it's getting worse, but slowly. So I think people are now more aware of the, of the problems in the summer and they are ready to uh, wear their masks and, and be more careful. So uh, we'll see, but uh, there's more contamination. But I think, I think uh, the situation seems to be more or less stable. I mean, that's the impression you get. Yeah. So your lab is, is back to normal operation? The lab, the lab is normal operation, yeah, since June. So uh, the summer, of course, has been a break, but uh, the French usual summer break. But now mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody's back. And uh, yeah, I would say apart from everybody wearing masks, the lab is in normal operation. Oh, good. And uh, good. the students have come back as well. OK. So is it going to be in-person instruction for the courses? Uh, not 100% uh, not because the rooms are not big enough. So uh, we, we fill the rooms with 50% uh, of students. Uh, mm. And so there is partly online, partly uh, on, on site. But all mm. the uh, lab work is done, is done with the students. Mm. Mm. Yeah, here. Uh, Engineering here decided to go fully online, but yeah. some other faculties they they still have the like the hybrid method, partly online, partly in person. So we'll we'll see how the experiments goes. Yeah, I think for our uh, ESPCI is famous for its uh, uh, practical training. So uh, if we remove that, then I think it will be uh, a big loss for students. So uh, yeah. at the moment we are we are keeping the small groups. Yeah. But it's just starting now. Mm. So hopefully uh, we don't have too many contamination. Students are not very worried, but the, the instructor is a little bit more. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's one question that I always want to ask you, Costantino, uh, is um, I like to think of you as a material scientist, but you had a very long collaboration with mechanicians. And we're talking about three decades, right? Uh, three decades, give or take, uh, of, of uh, not only productive, but happy collaborations with mechanicians. Yes, So yes, yes. I, 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 I wonder if you could share some experiences because not everyone can find the sweet spot, right? That everybody is happy about, excited about. And, and so. Well, I, I, like the, I like to understand the mechanics problem. I think they're quite fascinating and uh, at the same time, uh, I think I like the chemistry and the material science. So bridging the gap between the two has always been uh, really an interest. So I, I could learn from both sides. I think uh, I, the collaboration has been happy because uh, I was interested in learning more mechanics. And I think uh, often my collaborator were maybe interested in learning uh, more material science. I think the, the, the happy collaboration happened when we learned from each other. So indeed, uh, but recently I've uh, had more collaboration with uh, synthetic chemists, I have to say, uh, because uh, the, the tool of the chemistry were really useful for uh, the kind of problem that uh, I'm uh, working on right now. Yeah, yeah, but and of I course see... the... Go ahead. No, I, I, I think the, the, you know, using new tools to, to help to understand mechanics problem is really something that, uh, I, I'm interested in. I think uh, it's at, really at the interface between the discipline and it's the kind of thing that we also do at ESPCI. It's a little bit easier to organize. You can really have labs with people with uh, a variety of expertise in the same place. So I think that makes it easier. Hey, Ishwana. Yeah. Oh, hey, Constantino, how are you? Good. <laughs> It's so nice that uh, uh, you suggest this, uh, uh, you know, memory station for Mark. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, really, unfortunately, I wish we didn't, but uh, still, I think you would be happy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, a few minutes before uh, 10, then I will start that and I will share a, uh, a slide on the screen. Yeah, Ken, I think yeah. you can start uh, this uh, remembrance session 
are at 10 because uh, people sign in, a lot of people sign in at 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So That's better too. Yeah, it, we can always uh, extend uh, Constantino's uh, talk uh, beyond 11. Okay. It's okay. <clears throat> yeah, that sounds good. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Manoj. Yes, Manoj. Yeah, okay. You. Okay, I, I somehow was having difficulty. Uh, so somehow I managed to uh, get my audio going. But let me see this one. This is I cannot... Uh, we see you now. My... Oh, great, great, great. So there were some problems. Uh, okay, so now it is resolved. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, on that line of, uh, you know, studying materials and mechanics uh, of uh, fracture, uh, Costino, you did a lot, a lot of work trying to understand the uh, adhesion and cohesion in polymer materials. And yeah. uh, what, uh, what impressed me a lot is that you always look at the problem from, from different scales, um, from the molecular scale all the way to the continuum mechanics scale. Um, so maybe this question is a little bit silly. <laughs> Why are you not satisfied with a, a, a phenomenological approach where you just measure the apparent properties and not worry about What's underneath? Um, I think uh, because my uh, most of my industrial contacts uh, are material scientists and chemists, and uh, they are quite interested in, in uh, understanding how uh, changes in chemistry or changes in the material will uh, affect the mechanical property. So they, they do not really want to study usually the mechanical property as such, so it's not really a, sometimes they have real mechanics problem, which are, have more to do with geometry and complex loading. And, but often they, they really would like to know uh, why are the mechanical property changes in this way and that way, if I do uh, this type of chemistry or formulation change. And uh, I think if you want to answer that kind of question, then you really need to uh, be interested in the, in the details of the material itself and how you make it. And, uh, and I think this is really where my interest uh, has, uh, has come from, from, from I think the company, Ma many uh, uh, I think contacts with company that were asking interesting questions then got me interested in, in uh, uh, this type of multi-scale problem. Mm. And of course, other people uh, you know, that have similar, uh, similar idea, many, many scientists. Some of which are here. Can, can, I, can I give a little anecdote on that one? Sure. Yes, go ahead, so <laughs> I, I was when I when I first joined the uh, DuPont Experimental Station when I was in industry, um, coming from a background in mechanics, I was shown this quotation from Orowan, the famous Orowan, where he said, uh, "Well, mechanicians, they you know, you, you give you give them a, uh, a watch." and to figure out how to uh, how a watch works and then they'll they'll do a tensile test on it you can't figure out how a watch works by doing a tensile test on it. <laughs> <laughs> good anecdote good anecdote <laughs> yeah i i'm asking because i also interact with some some companies and and some of them don't want to know why they just want things to work <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that for sure. They, they, that they want things to work. But uh, sometimes <laughs> if you know a little bit more than they do, you yeah. can give them good advice on how to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, they don't want to pay for you to study how it works. That's, that's uh, right. They want a solution like in six months. We want but I think in, in, uh, in France, it's not, it's maybe easier than in other places to get this kind of industrial funding. The government uh, is quite supportive of uh, industrial funding to academia. So uh, they, I think companies uh, maybe fund a little bit more of that kind of fundamental work. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's possible. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I learned from your website that you are the vice president research now. For since last year, yes, yes, uh, it's more okay. of an administrative position for the 
for my school. So uh, this is more coordinating uh, uh, large equipment, big projects, uh, and are you know, giving money to the different labs. And uh, it's, it's an interesting job. It takes about 50% of my time. Yeah, it, it is big uh, administrative role. Um when I'm thinking about our VP research. <laughs> it's like department head or this kind of job, I think, yeah. similar. Yeah. Do you travel a lot for that position? Uh, right now, <laughs> right, right now, not really. <laughs> no, but yeah. not, be, not, not more than before. No, no, not, not really that much. Actually, I travel less. Uh-huh. Because there's no real conference for, for that type of job. It's more a local job. You, oh, you have okay. to stay more uh, there and, and uh, you have to restrict a bit travel. But okay. again, right now, it's not a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Nobody true. travels. Yeah. Our VP research travels a lot because they uh, kind of go internationally and find collaborations and sign contract, uh, sign MOUs and those kind of things. So uh they travel a lot and it's it's a tremendous amount of work <laughs> so okay yeah we have somebody more in charge of international uh, uh relation that does that so it, it can be me but it's not the main part it's more mm -hmm. the local coordination of the research yeah but if mm -hmm. somebody comes to the school then i will have to host them discuss with them uh, if we have visitors, then then you're representing the research of the ESPCI. So then you have to, indeed, there, there is some representation job. But I learned of, about other topics that I didn't know. So it's interesting. Hey, Ken, you yeah. have assembled a distinguished panel of really good people. Do you want to ask the individual to say one word, uh, one, one sentence or two about themselves? This is, this is a different community. Yes, yes. I am really, really glad and, 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 and grateful that these uh, your distinguished researchers accept the invitation. Uh, but of course, they, uh, Constantino, you are famous and people love you. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, I think it would be beneficial to uh, maybe uh, on my screen, uh, the, the person next to me is uh, Professor Bo Pearson. Maybe we'll start with you to just give a few words of introduction. Yeah, so my name is Bo Pearson. I am originally from Sweden, but have been working most of my time in Germany and also sometime at IBM, uh, Yorkton Heights and IBM uh, Rischlikon. Um, and uh, I'm interested in all aspects of tribology, uh, also viscoelastic cracks and uh, adhesion and things like that. So I have a lot of over overlap with Creton. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to listen to this presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I read a lot of paper of yours on the surface roughness. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> State of the art. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the next on my screen is uh, Mayumi Kwashi. Can you, um, yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, can, can you hear me? No problem. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm Koichi Mahimi. I'm working in the University of Tokyo, Japan. And uh, I was a postdoc of Constantino six or seven years ago. And uh, now, so I, I'm working on the mechanical and the fracture uh, properties of supramolecular polymer networks, polymer gels, or for example, slide ring gels and, and so on. Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the webinar. <clears throat> And Professor Silva, staying oh. up for this seminar. <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, um, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, I'm in Wollongong in Australia. I am mainly retired from the University of Wollongong. I've known Costantino for many years since he was a PhD student with Ed Kramer. And then he came and did a postdoc with, uh, with me at IBM. And we've worked in pretty similar areas, basically, um, of 
failure and adhesion and those sorts of things. So, but I don't do a lot now, it must be said, apart from cycling. <laughs> <laughs> and no longer in Europe, yeah. Uh, you can't leave Australia. Yeah. No, you, you, I, I would never get permission at this point to get on a plane and leave the country, from the government, that is. Yeah. Um, we're trapped here. Yeah, but you can still do cycling and you have oh, yeah. Very, yeah, a very ambitious plan to, uh, to like cycle through Australia or? No, no, not, not, not. Well, we can't even leave the state. Oh, okay. South Wales. So I'm trapped moment. in paradise, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a bad place, but, uh, but no, we can't go very far. No, uh, the current plans are basically just when it warms up a little bit into the, into the hills. The next plan is to go skiing. Yeah. In late winter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting, I ski too, because we, we are close to the mountain and we have the snow that doesn't melt. Uh, we get lots of people used to this year. I don't know. We used to get lots of people from Australia. I think they, you know, when the Australia is summer, they come here to ski, and then when Australia is winter, they go back to ski. So they, they ski year round. I think that's true, though. The skiing is not good in Australia. I believe it's better in New Zealand, but um, yeah, it's uh, the hills are not high enough here. Uh -huh. You could say the same for cycling. Normally, I'd, I would have spent some period in the summer in the European Alps or in, in the Rockies, but couldn't this year. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, really nice to see you. Uh, I think it's been a while since I saw you at the conferences. <laughs> it's really nice I to see you again. Uh, and then, Anand, you're next. Hi, Tian, thanks. I'm Anand Jagota. I'm, uh, at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. As I said a little earlier, I spent, uh, before coming here, I spent nearly 15 years in industry. I work on the same sorts of things that most of the people in this group do. Uh, interfaces, mechanical properties, adhesion, friction, structured surfaces. Um, so that, in a nutshell. And I work with many of the people in this group as well. So hello, everybody. Thanks. And Anna was my uh, postdoc supervisor, so we had a great time together. Uh, Tern? Tern Lee is next on my oh, screen. Thank, thank you, Tian. And uh, it's my great honor to be with all this great panel here. My name is Tang Lee. I'm from University of Maryland. And uh, thank you, Tian, for bringing uh, uh, this great panel here. And uh, I'm also one of the associate editors of uh, Extreme Mechanics Letters here. Uh, we're here to serve you. Thank you. And Lars, Professor Lars Pastewka. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm Lars Pastewka. I'm based in Freiburg, Germany, and I'm a computational physicist, so computational material science guy working also on, of course, friction, adhesion, rupture, what I guess everybody else is, is working on. And I'm, I'm here to say a couple of words about Mark Robbins, with whom I did a postdoc um, um, in a couple of minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was a last minute uh, call and uh, thank you, Lars, for, for being here. Uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Davis, Professor Chelsea Davis. Uh, we can hear you somehow. Uh, can't hear you. How about now? Can you hear me now? Cool. Hi, I am Chelsea Davis. I'm an assistant professor at Purdue University in the School of Materials Engineering. I've been here for about three and a half years now. And I am an experimental material scientist mechanician, and I do a lot of development of new metrology tools and new characterization tools to specifically look at uh, the surface properties of um, soft matter. And I'm here primarily because I was a postdoc of Cosentino, and now I'm very excited about getting into mechanophores. Um, yeah, so that's me. 
Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Elin Chen from China. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Elin Chen. Uh, I was once a postdoc in Rinkus Benchmark Group in Andersen, uh, involved in the Nikano Canada National Project. So during that time, I had a good collaboration with the first Cantina and also with the Steve. Uh, then I, uh, six years ago, I moved back to China and now I'm in uh, Tianjin University, China, very close to Beijing. So uh, I think uh, Professor Su and Professor Zhao is, uh, should be very familiar with our university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, Xuanhe, you were at Nankai or? Uh, I I don't know I, I don't remember which way Xuan He graduated. I graduated uh, from Tianjin University. Oh, Tianjin, yeah, okay, yeah. So that's the same university. I got my bachelor's degree there. Right. Thank you, Elon. And Thank Steve, you. Professor Steve Craig. Yeah, hi, uh, Steve Craig, Department of Chemistry at Duke, and. Uh, very much like thinking about molecular mechanisms and in, in materials undergoing mechanical uh, processes. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, Professor Rong Long. I am uh, <clears throat> mechanical engineering at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. So I work on the mechanics of uh, adhesion and fracture, typically soft uh, polymers. And I uh, collaborate with uh, Constantino. Uh, very glad to be here, uh, such an honor. Thank you. Xuanhe, uh, do you want to say just a Yes, Xuanhe uh, Zhao from MIT. I work on soft materials. Great to see so many good friends here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Manoj Chaudhary. Manoj. Okay. okay, yeah. Thank you, Zigan. Thank you, Tian, for organizing this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, my, uh, I'm from Lehigh University. And... Uh, uh, like you, I also have known Constantino when he was a graduate student, although a little bit towards the you know when he was almost finishing um, at Cornell. Uh, so I have uh, I have worked in the area very similar to all of your working surface interface mechanics, uh, and uh, 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 for the last few years, my interest has changed because of the funding. And I'm now mostly working on uh, turbulence, turbulence induced emulsification and uh, those sort of things. But I find that many of the things that I learned in my research in uh, interface and adhesion are very much applicable at liquid liquid interface, which is very amazing. So I'm looking forward to this uh, great seminar from Constantin. Thank you, Naj. Uh, Li Huajing. Hi, everyone. And this is Li Huajing. I'm an assistant professor at UCLA. Uh, I work on stimuli responsive soft materials and also mechanics of soft materials. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people here today and look forward to the talk. Thank you. Uh, Luca Cipolletti. Sorry, I made my mind. Hello, oh, that's great. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Luca Cipolletti. I am a professor in Montpellier, South France, and I have been developing uh, scattering methods that actually mix uh, imaging and light scattering, and I've used them for a while to study glasses and gels at rest, and now, since a few years, I'm very much interested in applying these methods to uh, soft materials under a mechanical drive. And uh, we recently started a collaboration uh, with Constantino. So I'm really very, very happy to be here with uh, all of you. Thank you. Um, so uh, what time is the... Uh, Jigang, if you don't mind, uh, I, we, we still have a few uh, EML associate editors, uh, but I uh, can I first introduce the panel for today's uh, webinar? I see uh, uh, Professor Al Crosby is here. Yeah, please go ahead. Your decision, whatever you want to do. Okay, 
Yeah, so Al, uh, could you uh, please just say a few words about yourself? We just uh, get to. Sure. sure. So um, it's good to see everyone. I'm glad to be here. My name is Al Crosby. I'm a professor of polymer science and engineering at UMass Amherst. I um, have worked on soft materials, fracture, thin films, <laughs> adhesion, and I've known Cosentino a very long time, maybe not since a grad student, but for a long time. And um, I've tried to advertise this as widely as I can. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the seminar. Um, it's always so inspiring to, to listen to Costantino. Thank oh, you. I also want to mention, I'm going to have to step off at 11. It's not because I didn't like what Costantino said, but I have to step off <laughs> right at 11 for, for another uh, meeting. So I apologize. <laughs> OK, and uh, Jigang, I saw Keith um, Storm raising hand. He's one yes. of the panels. Yeah, um, he, he is, uh, yeah, he will be here. Okay, so uh, Keith, when you come in, could you show yourself and just say a few words? Hey, uh, good morning, afternoon, depending on where you are, everybody. It's a pleasure to hear, be here. I'm sorry I'm a bit late. I was having some connectivity issues. Um, my name is Kay Storm. I'm a, a, a professor in the Department of Applied Physics at Eindhoven University of Technology. We work on theory and modeling of polymers and soft materials. I have an interest in modeling the structure property relationships of biological materials and synthetic materials that are inspired by biological materials. Really looking forward to, uh, to your talk, Cosentino. Okay, thank you. Um, Jigang, I think in the interest of time, I, I will start the... Uh session today? Please. Okay, I will share a screen. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, okay, so um, should I should I start? Uh, I am going to say a few words, uh, okay, Lars, okay. and then I will introduce you. Thank you. Okay. Um, good day. Bonjour, everyone. My name is Tian Tang, and I'm a professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. We are going to begin today's Extreme Mechanics Letters webinar uh, soon. But before we do, I would like to invite everyone to join us and remember a brilliant scientist an inspiring educator, a great colleague and friend, Professor Mark Robbins from Johns Hopkins University. We were all shocked and saddened to hear Mark's sudden passing a few weeks ago. In fact, at the beginning of August, when we contacted Mark about attending today's webinar as a panelist, he immediately replied, it is always fun to listen to Costantino. That would be a pleasure. It seems my schedule is open and I've put the time down. His passing is devastating and a huge loss for the scientific community. For the many fields he contributed to, from adhesion and fracture to mechanics and materials, from friction and tribology, to earthquakes and avalanches. We will forever miss him, not only as a leading scientist, but also as an extremely kind person. Next, I would like to invite Professor Lars Pastivka to say a few words. Uh, Lars, um, as mentioned, he is a professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany and uh, worked closely with Mark in the past. So Lars, I invite you to Mute and begin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tian, for, for the introduction of Mark and also for, for asking me to say a couple of words. It's, of course, my, my honor, although it's one of the more difficult things that I've, I've done uh, in my life. So Mark died completely unexpectedly on, on August 13. I think he was 64. And um, I before that, I've, I've worked with him for the last decade, ever since I did a postdoc with him in 2011. I, I'll come to that um, in a second. So he was, he was exceptional, both as a scientist and as a person, and of course it's a great loss to, to his friends, um, to his the scientific community, but of course foremost it's the greatest loss to his family, his wife, Patty, and his two kids, uh, Thomas and, and Catherine. 
So let me say a couple of words about Mark. Uh, so he, he grew up in the Boston area and uh, did his undergraduate at Harvard, a PhD at Berkeley, then did a postdoc at Mobile Research, which I think is now Exxon Research in, in Annandale, New Jersey, and then joined the faculty of Johns Hopkins University, the Department of Physics and Astronomy, where he has stayed ever, ever since. He's known for, for his work on non-equilibrium problems using non-equilibrium statistical mechanics to study the things that we are all interested in, friction, adhesion, rupture, and um, uh, mostly surrounding um, soft materials or dis disordered materials. Um, I, I don't want to go too much detail on what he did, but let me just maybe outline uh, what I think is his best known contribution to science. Um, which is finding a microscopic explanation um, for Amontan's law. So Amontan's law is essentially high school physics. Um, in high school, we learned that the, the friction force uh, that is needed to slide two materials across each other is proportional to the normal force and the coefficient of proportionality um, is the friction coefficient. And I think it's a great testament to Mark's creativity that he really identified this problem as one of the great unsolved riddles. It's high school physics, right? Uh, um, and uh, that he managed to condense it down to something very simple and very generic. And uh, so he realized essentially that um, it's important um, to have um, um, dirt, dirt uh, adsorbates at surfaces, what he called dirt, in order for them to be able to interlock. So even if you have two smooth surfaces, think about crystals that are incommensurate, if you, as soon as you have a molecule on the surface, it can interlock with both sides of this uh, of the of the of the materials with both materials and essentially you need a force to move out of the potential energy well that this molecule sits inside and that gives rise at microscopic scales to Amontan's um, to Amontan's friction laws. Of course he did he did he did other contributions to many other fields including polymer mechanics, uh, contact mechanics, na nanofluidics, I don't want to go into detail, except that his contributions were always at the forefront of these fields as is also exemplified by, by many, many publications in, in very high level and prestigious journals. So, so in, in terms of his, his, his life, of course, I met him relatively recently. Uh, as I said, I joined his group in, in 2011. I already did my PhD on computational aspects uh, of um, friction, and I had read many of his works, uh, including the, the work on Amontan's law that I that I briefly outlined, and he was somewhat as a personal idol for me. So I absolutely wanted to work with him as a postdoc, and I am grateful that he accepted me as a postdoc, and it was certainly um, had a profound impact on my scientific formation. So I, I went to his group in 2011. Um, I actually brought my own funds. I had written this beautiful proposal in which I wanted to study how surface roughness changes as two surfaces slide against each other. Each other. And then during the first days in Baltimore, Mark said, well, yes, um, but adhesion is also interesting. I think he said this twice. And so we ended up working on adhesion. And uh, I never really worked on what was in the proposal. Please, please tell the funding agency, but I think we we did a couple of interesting things. So working with him was a blast because it was completely orthogonal to, to what my experience was before. I had looked at individual atoms and the chemical complexities, how bond breaks break and um, uh, with brute force molecular dynamics. And with Mark, it was about the big picture, about reducing problems uh, to, its, to its essence, looking at simplified models. Um, I spoke with my, my friend and also a former postdoc of Mark, Martin Müser on the phone yesterday, and Martin told me that before he met Mark, um, he, he, he said he didn't think you could do top-notch physics with just beads and springs, but this is what Mark did. So he reduced it to the, to the basic core and then extracted, uh, extracted constitutive relations in the basic physics of, of the problem. It always involved a little bit of disorder. And when I arrived, he had developed a fascination or maybe a slight obsession with surface roughness that actually um, also sucked me in completely up to this day. I'm fascinated by it. And, and so I, I learned from him about random fields, surface roughness, constitutive behavior and how to extract it by looking at data collapses and other statistical techniques. So that's the scientific side, but also uh, let me also say that he was an extremely fun person. He was fun nature. He always had a good story to tell. And something that many of us will probably remember are his dancing skills um, that were typically shown to the public uh, on the last days of either the tribology or the adhesion um, 
uh, Gordon Research Conference. So at the end of the Gordon Conference, there, there used to be, and I hope in the future there will be a lobster dinner, and then you go to the bar and there's a dance floor and you would find him there. So I, I vividly remember, I think that was the GSC Tribology 2018, when my former postdoc, Adam, came to me and he was shocked and he was asking me, is that Mark Robbins on the dance floor? Yes, yes, it was Mark. So he was an outstanding scientist of the high, highest caliber. He was an inspiring mentor to his students and postdocs. He's, I certainly owe him my scientific career. He was a very good natured and fun human being. And I think that were Mark given the opportunity to comment uh, on his own death, I think his words would be, what a waste. What a waste of a kind person and an excellent scientist. So thanks, Tian, for, for letting me speak these words. Mark will be dearly missed, I guess, by, by, by all of us. Uh, thank you, Lars. And we also thank EML for providing this opportunity for us to uh, remember Professor Mark Robbins. Um, I share my screen. Uh, yes, Constantino, if you could share your screen now. Here it says only host. Yeah, it's okay. I think, I guess, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Somehow my, uh, my Zoom is frozen out. Um, it's okay. I will, uh, I will introduce you, uh, Constantino, then uh, when you talk, you, your talk starts and I will try to restart it, my Zoom, it's frozen. But you can hear me, right? I can hear you. Okay. Um, so now uh, it is my honor to introduce today's EML webinar speaker, Professor Constantino Criton. Uh, Professor Criton is a CNRS director at the ESPCI Paris PSL University and also serves as the vice president research of the institution. He graduated in material science from EPFL in Switzerland and received his PhD from the materials science and engineering department of Cornell University in the US. He worked at the IBM Research Center before joining ESPCI. Constantino is the world's leading expert in adhesion and fracture of soft polymer materials. He has developed very creative solutions for experimentally measuring and analyzing adhesion, damage, and fracture. Mm. He has published more than 200 journal articles and has given more than 110 invited and plenary lectures. He has received many awards, to name just a few. He was awarded the Adhesion Society's Prize for Excellence in Adhesion Science and elected as fellow of the American Physical Society. He is a distinguished professor at the Global Station for Soft Matter of Hokkaido University. He also received a European Research Council advanced grant, which is only awarded to, and I quote, exceptional leaders in terms of originality and significance of their research contribution to pursue a groundbreaking high-risk project. So today we will hear from Constantino his recent interest in the use of mechanochemistry to investigate fracture. With yes. that, I will hand the screen to you, Constantino. Thank you very much for this, uh, this kind introduction. It's very much a pleasure to be here uh, and have such a, a great audience. It's definitely a new experience. It never would be possible in, uh, in a normal seminar. So it's really more like being in a conference. Uh, today, I uh, decided to tell you a story about recent experiments, which indeed have to do with the funding I received from the European Union to use Mechano 4 to study fracture. So it's very much a collaborative work with synthetic chemists, uh, physicists, uh, mechanicians, and I'm going to try to give you an idea of what we were looking for. And I think uh, uh, the, the title really is what I'm trying to investigate here is uh, how much can we be quantitative? What are the difficulties about using mechanophore for quantification? If you're in solid mechanics, you normally like numbers and quantities and, and, 
simulations and not necessarily only scaling. So uh, that was the idea. So first, a uh, little introduction for student attending. Uh, fracture, the typical fracture that you learn uh, in, in, uh, in school, in graduate school, will be about linear elastic fracture mechanics, about brittle material, where a bond, a chemical bond, is very localized. So you don't really have to worry about it for your material property. In glass, it's extremely localized. So here's an AFM picture from my colleague, uh, Matteo Cicotti. And on the, on the right, you see also, I don't know if my... Uh, my pointer can be seen, but you, this is an AFM uh, slide uh, picture of uh, PMMA and epoxy, where you can see also uh, some local plastic. But uh, in any case, in, in this type of hard uh, material, uh, you have an elastic behavior everywhere, except very locally close to the crack tip. Uh, I'm much more interested in soft material, but I started, uh, and this is my connection with Mark Robbins, uh, with interfaces between uh, glassy polymers. So this paper here in 1998, you can see on the right, it's an experimental paper where we were looking at uh, adhesion between two glassy polymer and the, in particular, the effect of molecular interpenetration. So we were looking with molecular techniques at how far uh, these molecules were interpenetrating at the interface. This was typically uh, nanometers, a few nanometer, and we were looking at macroscopic fracture using a, a double cantilever beam. And uh, so a few years later, actually, uh, Mark, uh, with one of his postdocs, worked on uh, the kind of the same problem in a way, where he looked at uh, polymer interfaces with the type of coarse grain simulation that he uh, was using typically, and uh, uh, demonstrated indeed that uh, the type of length scale that we were finding experimentally were very much also found in simulation and you could find pull out for very low interpenetration and, and fracture of the chains for, for even a few nanometer of interpenetration. So it was a, certainly a, a subject of discussion uh, between the two of us. And, and although we didn't really work mm. often in the same topic, there was a lot of uh, uh, inter overlap in terms of thinking. Uh, Another paper that concerns interfaces that we worked on was in 2007, then it was a polymer melts. So in this case, we were looking really at polymeric fluids and how very high molecular weight polymeric fluids that look more like viscoelastic solid could stick to each other, again, depending on how they interpenetrate. And uh, in this experiment, there was very much a coupling between molecular effects and bulk effects. It was impossible to really localize the problem and uh, I think this is really more the focus of the rest of my talk. I'm going to look at fracture of uh, indeed soft material, elastomers more particularly. And here I'm just showing you the type of problem that you have. This uh, one on the left here, maybe you can, I'm starting a video. So this video shows a, a crack, uh, you see about the size, one millimeter, into a rubber uh, that is typically used for tires. So this is actually a field rubber. Uh, and you can see, uh, if you can see the video, it looks very much like filaments breaking. And it doesn't really look like the tip of a crack. It looks like a very open crack. Uh, and the, the fracture is everything but localized. So, so the question of how this type of material break is, is quite open. And on the right, you have example of uh, pressure sensitive adhesive. So these are a uh, very soft material that have a solid property, but can deform enormously before they actually either break or detach from surfaces. These were also problems that we were, we were looking into. Do you have uh, breakages in this type of material and how do they actually uh, debond? So current work. Uh, now coming back to fracture from the point of view of, of let's say a, a schematic picture of fracture for me, uh, there is, on one end, uh, the mechanics, which uh, tries to relate uh, the microscopic scale with, with local, uh, local plasticity or deformation. And then you have an energy balance, you have stress fields, and uh, this is really the realm of mechanics, very much microscopic. Uh, at the intermediate scale, uh, more microns, there may be uh, heterogeneous deformation processes. 
uh, which are localized plasticity uh, for polymer glasses. But I think for, for soft material like elastomers, you can see things like filaments and, and uh, cavitation, fiber formation. Those are, are uh, typically at the micron length scale. They can be smaller, they can be uh, at the 10 or 100 nanometer, but often we still can see things optically. Now, uh, the, the subject I'm going to talk about is at a smaller length scale. So uh, if, you, if you're looking inside these filaments, at some point for elastomer, you will have to break bonds because elastomer are made of uh, chemical networks. These networks are made of strong bonds. And, and of course, there's weak interaction between the molecules. But these strong bonds need to break for the material to break. And the question is really, uh, what's the connection between this bond breaking and the material breaking? Uh, and, and this is what we're going to look at. Now, uh, the topic is really about using mechanochemistry, as, as Jan was saying. So uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, or maybe a little bit longer now, uh, synthetic chemists have uh, developed some molecules, or, or maybe they have pointed out that these molecules could be used uh, to detect some changes in materials. And the idea behind this molecule is really about, uh, about optical detection. So uh, the, the first one, and maybe the best known one, is spiropyr, and this one here on the top left, uh, which has a, a closed cycle. If you actually apply a force to that molecule, uh, and this can be done, I'll show you that it can be done at the molecular level. Uh, one of these cycles opens up, uh, and this is a reversible reaction, and turns into a different molecule that actually has some fluorescence and also absorbs in the visible wavelength. So for example, uh, here in the picture, this is uh, at the bottom, you see a sample. This is from the, the seminal work of uh, Nancy Sotos and, and Jeff Moore. Uh, so they pull on this uh, elastomer sample. And here it, you can see that it changes color, it becomes red. So in a way, it's possible to detect that. We uh, worked on a different one. So this was developed in the group of Rin Sivisma and, and Yula and Chen, a dioxetane molecule. I should say that all of these molecules are not commercially available. So if you actually want to do this in your own lab, uh, you have to synthesize this or collaborate with the synthetic chemists. So this particular molecule here has a, a four-membered cycle here that when it breaks, has a probability of emitting light. The probability is, is not very high. You need some other tricks to improve the signal. But we use successfully this molecule to actually detect in real time the breakdown of sacrificial bonds uh, into a uh, multiple network elastomer, something inspired by the double network gels of, of jumping gong. And we could really map for a given sample uh, regions where there was a high level of bond breakage at any given time or low level of bond breakage. So in a way, uh, a relative quantification. But on the other hand, more recently, a different molecule has been developed by the same group and also by uh, Robert Gussel, who had now has his own uh, synthetic group uh, at the University of Aachen in Germany. So this is based on uh, a modified version of the anthracene molecule. So the anthracene molecule is, is a well-known fluorescent molecule. Anthracene needs to be excited in the UV. It's not super practical for, for uh, confocal microscopy. So this version with the pi extension, uh, this fragment here is fluorescent. So if you look at the intact molecule, it has a bond. It's called a Diels-Alder bond here. This intact molecule is transparent, so it doesn't absorb in the visible range and also does not produce any fluorescence if you illuminate it. But if this bond breaks, and this is a bond that is a bit weaker uh, than a covalent bond, but it's still a strong bond, it's a, it's a type of covalent bond, uh, and this fragment here becomes fluorescent. So one of the two fragments can be then detected. Now uh, you will see that it has some advantage. I'm going to show you an example to go towards the topic of the talk about quantification. First, uh, I, I really love this paper I mean, by, by Steve's group. Uh, I often cite it because I think it's a fantastic uh, chemistry experiment and, and really shows physics on the molecule. So he actually polymerized one of these pyroperans uh, so that he made a polymer chain with lots of these pyroperans uh, daisy chaining each other. 
And uh, in this way, he could actually do AFM single molecule experiment, pull on uh, the molecule, and look at the force at which these cycles would open. So if you look at these curves here, uh, there's a force versus separation. So this is nanometer. We are he's pulling on these daisy chain uh, molecules of, of spiroferrin. And at a given force in around 250 piconewton, you have an opening of this cycle. This is about a tenth of the force to break a carbon-carbon bond. So, so uh, in this case, at that level of force, you change the color. So if you can be that quantitative, it may be possible to use this molecule also uh, in material, which is our idea to, to be quantitative with force. So we, um, we made elastomers. And I'm going to show you, uh, uh, so in, in a way, a simplified picture here. But uh, what we are doing is mixing the ingredients, uh, including some of that yellow uh, here representing the spiroferin, the mechanophore, and also another crosslinker. So there is about 0.5% crosslinker in this uh, network. So it's not very crosslinked. 90% <coughs> is a regular one, giving you carbon covalent bonds. And 10% is this mechanophore crosslinker. We hope that it's distributed randomly. Now, uh, if you take one of these molecules, one of these networks, and you try to pull on it, it will break very locally. And uh, you will activate the molecule very locally. I'll show you that we can still get information, but it's not the easiest way. So initially, what we did is we uh, used uh, the technique of embedding, so the multiple network system. So uh, when we synthesized this uh, network, we, swole, we, we actually had a swelling step in solvent and monomer. Then the monomer of the same, exactly the same polymer can be polymerized. So here I'm showing a red and blue color just to show that it's two different polymerization, but it's actually exactly the same material, but the, the, the blue chains are pre-stretched. So it's a bit like taking uh, a filler, a continuous filler of fibers and putting them into a matrix. The matrix comes in, extends the chains of this fiber in all three directions, so it's isotropic. And then uh, the advantage of this method is that you can break some of these blue chains without breaking the material. So we can actually follow, uh, for example, for the activation of the mechanophore, uh, it's like having an internal probe inside of the material. Now, uh, let me go to the next step. I'm going to show you some examples. So if you uh, make one of these uh, embedded network uh, with the spiroperon that uh, indeed changes its light absorption. I have a little video. I hope you can see it. So this is an elastic sample. You're pulling on it. And in this case, the color changes from transparent to blue. So you can see that the sample becomes blue. Uh, here, there are snapshots of this, depending on the stretch. As you stretch it, it becomes blue. So this is something that you can actually quantify. So the, the, the data is taken with a simple RGB camera. Sorry. You can quantify the red, the blue, and the green. Of course, a spectrometer would give you even better data. But in this case, we wanted it pixel by pixel. And you can look at the stress. Here, we I'll show you the nominal stress, because we see that really it's a force per molecule. Uh, and the onset of color change here happens around 1.5 megapascal. Above that, we have a continuous color change. And this continuous color change is not because the molecule changes its color, but because the number of molecules that are activated increases with microscopic stretch. Now, it's possible to calibrate that. So if we look at the red and the blue, we can make one of these maps here on the left. And we can associate to each combination of red and blue change relative to a neutral color a value of stress. So, so this can be done in uniaxial extension. Now, what we were interested in is to see whether we could use this uniaxial extension data to actually get some information on a more complex geometry. Because we are interested in fracture, we try to do this with cracks. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the sample here that shows stress versus stretch, you can see that the sample has a slight change in color. If you look up on the upper image uh, and you look close to the crack, which is at that point completely open, you should see a slight blue. I hope you can see it. Now, this slight blue in the raw data 
can be analyzed if you take the images and you properly normalize them and uh, calibrate it. And you can extract from that uh, a value that corresponds to the stress in uniaxial extension. Now, your mechanician, you will say, OK, but in a crack here, it's not exactly uniaxial extension. It looks like, but it's not the same. So this was a collaboration with Rong Long. And uh, we uh, used not the, the maximum the, the uniaxial extension, because it's variable in this case, but the maximum stretch. So by looking at the maximum stretch and saying, assuming that the activation level corresponds to the maximum stretch, we can actually compare the experiment with a simulation. So this is what we're doing here. This is the experiments for two different materials, uh, very close to fracture, using the same uh, stress map, because we're using the same probe in this case. And if you look at the finite element simulation, which is slightly tilted, just like the sample, and you can see that the agreement here is actually pretty good, knowing that there is no adjustable parameter in the simulation. So the, the simulation is taken directly from the, the calibration. And uh, we, we're just stretching on it. And here, you're calculating the stress. So this is the calculation based on the material model. And this is the actual measurement. Now, the advantage of this measurement is that you are measuring the stress directly. So it's not a digital image correlation measurement. We are not getting the stress from the strain. We are actually introducing a stress sensitive probe uh, inside the material. And by looking at the activation of that uh, force sensitive probe, we can actually directly measure the stress. So, so I think it's something really different from other methods. Of course, you need to embed it in the material. So you need some chemistry, but it's still something that we find pretty exciting to, to use. Uh, a second variation uh, on the same system, if you unload the molecule, uh, so you pull, it becomes blue. If you then release it, it becomes purple. As you can see from the picture, if you reload, it becomes blue. It turns out that the exact uh, shade of purple that you see uh, is dependent on how much blue the sample was, so how many molecules you activated. So by analyzing the purple color, you can see uh, what was the, the actual stress, whether it was loading or unloading, and you can actually get the stress history. So knowing what was the maximum stress in that point. So we, I'm showing here just an image that show in which way this is different. If you actually look at the propagating crack, so the crack now is moving, and the region that you can see recolored in purple is region that has been loaded and now is being unloaded. So when you detect a color which corresponds to unloading, you know that the crack has actually moved. Now, uh, if, you if you look at the sample when it's completely broken, I'm not going to show you images here, you can, from the color purple, you can actually uh, understand how much stress was there as a function of position. So we, we submitted a paper now, again, a collaboration with the group of Ron Long, and the quantitative agreement is really not bad at all and for, for something that really goes directly from molecules to microscopic without uh, adjustable parameters. Now, uh, I told you that we were discussing bond scission. The previous example, we were trying to actually measure stress directly by using molecules. Now, uh, detecting bond scission, uh, we had done that uh, with the luminescence experiment. This was the the paper published in Science with the dioxetane. So in a way, it's a fascinating molecule. It gives you a signal when it breaks. So you have time resolved data. The problem, though, is that the, the signal is relatively weak. You really need a sensitive camera to do the measurement, which means that you tend to lose resolution because the noise, the noise becomes important. Uh, and the magnification cannot be very high. Plus, if you can only do dynamic tests, uh, the quantification or, for example, using focal microscopy for 3D images is not really possible. So there are a number of limitations. The synthesis is also uh, maybe trickier, uh, even compared to other organic chemistry molecules. So uh, we were very keen on trying the fluorescent ones. So uh, this was uh, something, again, published in 2016. And when I started, uh, 
my project, the European project. So I thought we should really try this uh, for fracture problems. So uh, the, the molecule is shown here. And it's a five-step synthesis. You still need a, a few weeks of a good student to synthesize it. But once you have it, you can attach it to a network just like the previous one. Now, the, the biggest difference is that the fluorescence that it uh, gives out is very stable and high intensity. So it gives you a detection threshold, which is much, much lower. You can really detect the molecule at least two orders of magnitude lower in concentration. And because uh, you can do, uh, if, if you don't look at the propagating crack, but a static crack or a fractured surface, you can also do 3D images. So this shows you basically the, the principle you uh, excite the molecule around 400 nanometer with a laser, and then you collect uh, the signal around 450. So uh, we, we can do this quantitatively, again, with a confocal microscope. So the synthesis is uh, the same. To give you an idea, you incorporate, again, the ingredient. You, you put a very small amount, in this case, 0.02 mole percent relative to monomer. Uh, then a UV polymerization of two hours gives you a piece of uh, polymer like this. Uh, and this is something that you can directly test. So it's completely transparent and it doesn't emit any fluorescence when these cross linkers uh, are incorporated. Now, uh, of course, one thing you can do to look at the sample is now to have a fluorescent source and a fluorescence detector. So uh, there is an instrument for that, which is very used in biology the confocal microscope, so the scanning confocal microscope, uh, you're actually sending the beam to a pinhole and you're looking at the signal only from a specific plane. So if, you're, if, the, if the light is going through a transparent material, it really picks up the signal on that plane and then it comes back up. You only collect the intensity. So it's a scanning technique. It's not, you don't get the full field image, but you, you do scan the sample at a certain depth and obtain an intensity for each voxel. Uh, so in principle, you could go any depth, but in practice, you're limited by absorption. So uh, anyway, you can, you can put your sample flat on the surface, as shown here. And uh, then you put it under the microscope. You can stretch it, and you can do some imaging. So this is, uh, these two pictures here are images taken at two different magnification of the same sample. This sample contains a sacrificial bond. So it's one of these multiple network sample that has many chains that are really there designed to reinforce the material. So we have a large detection. This is in a way a tough elastomer, but in this case, we were pretty sure to see something. So this is the same elastomer that we used in the science paper, but now imaged with the fluorescent molecule in a static configuration. So the crack is just being open, but it's not propagating. There is one thing that you can see on the picture on the right. You can see the filaments. So you can see that the, the damage is very much 3D. Of course, your crack tip is not, it's not a 2D problem. It's a more complex 3D problem. Now, if you see these images, on the other hand, you can immediately uh, think that quantification is a bit tricky. I mean, how do you know how many bonds you've broken? Where do you put the limit? Uh, you have many uh, bond breaking in the bulk. Uh, so maybe this is not. For this such a sensitive molecule, we could actually tackle uh, networks where the bond scission is much more localized. And, and that was really the idea. So uh, now uh, in this uh, experiment, I'm going to show you a crack into a very simple uh, network. So this one is not uh, embedded. So we just have a, a normal network with a very small amount of mechanophore. And it's quite brittle. It's, uh, it's not, not filled. There is no filler. And if you look at the picture here, it gives you some signal. But now, in this case, the amplitude has been uh, boosted. But you can see some detection, even in this kind of material. Not easy, again, to quantify uh, because you have background. A lot of this is just background noise. So you have an issue of separating the signal from the background. But it looks that you have some detection here of activation of the molecule. And so some molecular damage is visible. So uh, what we did at that point, we said, well, this is an open crack. Uh, it's not going to be very reproducible. We have to make it with a blade. Uh, no two blades are the same. 
maybe it would be much better to look at crack propagation. So crack propagation should be more reproducible. We, we open the crack until it propagates, and then we are going to look at the fracture surfaces. The, the molecule, once it's broken, is permanently fluorescent. So we should be able to quantify these molecules after the sample is broken. So indeed, this is what we did. So we, we uh, did experiments uh, of fracture at different rates with different materials, different temperatures. And uh, we looked at the fracture plane now. So the fracture plane, the sample is broken. We are looking at an area where the crack was actually propagating. And we can also measure the propagation velocity from the uh, experiment. Now, uh, this particular image here on the left shows you the activation close to the surface. And I think you can see, yeah, it, it rotates a little bit. So on the left side, you have the fracture surface. And you can see that there is a kind of strip where the bonds are broken. Now, here you cannot see the length. But in this particular case, this is a, a sample broken relatively close to its last transition temperature. Uh, this is about 800 micrometers, so a much larger scale than the molecular size. And we detect quite a bit of bond breakage if we, if, we, if we look at the distance here from the surface. Now, this type of data is, is of course, you're in the direction of propagation. So the crack propagates into my screen in this case. So we can average it uh, and we can get an average profile by, by averaging the, the data, again, for different conditions. So what we found, uh, and this is just a, a first result I'm showing, is that if you actually do the experiment at different rates, so we break the sample at different rates, you don't see the same bond scission profile. You can see that at very low rates, it's more localized than if you actually break it faster, where you can see here much more bond breakage at a certain distance from the crack. And we certainly see bond scission microns from the crack surface, tens of microns from the crack surface. So, so this is not obvious, I think, uh, from the point of view of mechanics, these are very simple networks. They are very homogeneous. So they are uh, uh, just elastic chain connected together. So you could think that the breakage could be very close to the crack plane, as is normally used in, in models, and maybe not as far away from it. Now, the, the key reason why it's not the case is that uh, in reality, although the stresses are well behaved in the continuum mechanic sense, in the molecular sense, uh, the forces on molecule have a very wide distribution because the, the molecule between crossing points, first of all, have different length because the crossing is random. But you could also work with fixed length molecules but the most important thing is the end-to-end -end vector of each molecule has a distribution. When people say these chains are Gaussian, they fluctuate, of course, with time. They're, we are above the glass transition, so uh, you have uh, the, the typical uh, Brownian fluctuation. Now, these chains have initial conformation that can be very coiled or pre-stretched. So the, the, the chains that are shorter and more pre-stretched when we actually pull on the sample, will break first. The crossing point cannot fluctuate too much because they're, they're held in four points. So these crossing points pretty much deform a finely, in this type of uh, bulk elastomers, a finely with the, uh, with the stretch, with the microscopic stretch. But the chain have a very wide distribution. So uh, you're actually stretching your sample, let's say here vertically. But the distance between crossing points has this distribution, and the short chain will break first. Now, the fact that uh, the, the rate at which you're pulling has an effect is not completely obvious. So if you look at the chain level, you have uh, initially very coiled chains, or very, uh, very long ones that are coiled. And then you have more stretched ones. As you stretch, all these chains will change. They will get more and more stretched. and the, the short ones and the pre-stretch one will break. So when they break, we will start have fluorescent signal. So this is to explain why we have this distribution. Now, let me go back to quantification. Again, we, we can look at images. I've shown you images. But can we really know how many do we break? 
So we need to be a little bit careful with that. First of all, we, we are measuring, uh, of course, the scanning image. Now, there, there is optical aberration. So you have to really use calibration sample. So we typically use uh, a grid, which is used by microscopists, where every single point has the same intensity. So we can we correct our images by that grid to make sure we don't have uh, regions in the image where we have artifacts. The second thing that we need to correct is the absorption. So if you do an experiment 50 micron from the surface, you have more signal than 200 micron from the surface. So, so you have to really correct for that, do a depth scan initially, and uh, correct for the, the thickness which you're going through. Finally, uh, if you're measuring at interfaces, you have an optical index of refraction mismatch. So if you're like putting at your sample in air, we realize that in air you have reflections that really gives you additional uh, signal. So if you actually use glycerol, which has a very similar index of refraction, you have, in this case, a realistic signal. So if you take all of that into account, uh, you can have at least a realistic fluorescent signal. Now, you still would need to calibrate that with the number of molecules. So the next step, and this comes from our chemist friend, is that it's possible to synthesize this molecule on top, which looks very much like the broken fragment that you have in the real material. So this molecule is soluble in the polymer. So you can actually uh, solubilize the molecule at different concentration and then measure the intensity. And uh, if you measure the intensity of the functional concentration, there is a pretty good linear regime. If you continue higher, at some point, there, there is a, a plateau. But there is a nice region uh, of about a factor of 20 where you can have a, a linear regime. And you can use that to, to calibrate your data. Again, if you put the right kind of molecule in the sample. Uh, now I go to the next assumption, which is maybe the most important one. Uh, and where uh, you know I'll be welcome to, to field questions too. Uh, the representativity. So what we measure is a fluorescent profile, and this gives us a concentration of activated molecules. So this is fine. That's directly the measurement. Now the question is: This activated mechanophore relative to total mechanophore. We measure things in the in less than a percent. That's a very typical uh, measurement of where we are, we are really well in the detection limit. But what we really would like to know is how many polymer chains have broken, not just how many mechanophores. So we would like to say that, OK, this ratio is the same as the ratio between broken chain and total chain. So that essentially your mechanophore, the probability of breaking your mechanophore in the network is the same as that of breaking a stronger carbon-carbon bond in the network. Now, that hypothesis. Uh, implies that uh, the randomness of the chains is more important than the strength of the bond. And that, indeed, what, what is important is that you break the strand when it gets to its maximum extension. Then if you have a weak bond in there, which is our mechanophore, this will break. So every chain that gets stretched to its maximum extension breaks its mechanophore if there is one. So if that's true, then I think our, our measurement should be representative. And I'll show you some data that, in my opinion, shows that indeed we are. So from this, you can get a diff, an aerial density of broken chain in absolute terms, in chains per meter square, because you actually quantify how many chains you've broken through your calibration procedure. Now, this quantity, which again, we get without any adjustable parameter, is pretty consistent with what you would expect from the modulus of your material. From the elastic modulus, you know how many chains per unit area you have. So this comes back to the Lake and Thomas model. So uh, fracture models, uh, there is not that many molecular fracture model. And an old model is that by the Lake and Thomas, who pointed out that uh, in threshold conditions, so meaning if you completely forget about viscoelastic dissipation, the minimum energy needed to break a uh, network is uh, this value gamma zero, which is uh, the number of chains crossing the plane of crack propagation. That makes sense. You break covalent bonds. This UB in the original Lake Thomas model is the energy of any one of these uh, bonds in the chain, in the yellow chain. 
And what they added, uh, which is different from the, the normal fracture model, is this NX, the number of monomer in the chain. So what they assumed is that you need to fully stretch the chain before you can break it, which is reasonable. We assume the same. And that uh, when you break that chain, you lose all the energy. But there is a number of assumptions there, in particular the localization, uh, that you only break this yellow chain and you don't do anything to the environment that don't seem uh, very realistic. But they give you a pretty good value, which scales well, which is close to experiments, uh, and also has the right scaling. So th this model still has very much value in terms of predicting experimental results. But it doesn't look like the molecular picture is consistent with what we see, or we, we see something much less localized uh, than that. But we can compare with that. So we can normalize uh, our data. This is what we measure experimentally. Uh, and we can normalize that by the Lake Thomas uh, prediction for the same network. And we define this sigma bar, and that sigma bar can be one if Lake Thomas is verified, or can be much larger than one if you break much more than a molecular plane. Typically, in the example I showed you before, if we take this number of broken chains, it's about 50 times uh, the, the monolayer that you would predict from Lake and Thomas. Of course, this sample was broken far from threshold condition. There was viscoelasticity, so uh, the, the, it's not really very surprising. Now, uh, this is an experimental measurement. So this, this sigma bar is something we get directly from the fluorescent. If we want to go from that number to an energy, uh, then we need to assume some uh, value for the, ener the average energy to break one of these chains. Now, in, in Lake Thomas, uh, in the original Lake and Thomas model, uh, this value of 350 kilojoule per mole, which is uh, the, the energy of a carbon-carbon bond, is de definitely an overestimate. The probability of breaking becomes very significant for much lower levels of forces and energies. And so a recent paper, actually, that where Stephen is a, is a co-author, uh, argues that uh, on average, you could still break chains at a much lower energy, around 60 kilojoule per mole. Uh, and we are going to use that value in our estimates. But of course, this is, again, something that uh, has uh, its, its, uh, you know, its uh, imprecision. So if we do that, if we use 60 kilojoule per mole, uh, the energy that we get through damage in this particular case of the close to the glass transition is 250 joule per mole, about 10% of what we measure in terms of uh, fracture energy. So we measure two and a half kilojoule, and the bond scission can account for about 10% for this particular example. So seeing this, uh, we, we can do that more systematically. So, so uh, now the, the next step uh, is to say, OK, uh, how about uh, checking now for different conditions, different rates? and different temperature, uh, whether we can do that measurement, and uh, how quantitative are we? We can change some material parameters and change conditions. So this is actually not yet published, but it is, there is a preprint here on archive where you can get uh, the details. So uh, I have a few introduction slides just to get back to this viscoelastic uh, model. So the classic picture of uh, viscoelastic fracture uh, in a very general term, is that in threshold condition, you have indeed a Lake and Thomas type uh, fracture energy, which doesn't have to be this. I mean, the, the, it can be more generally seen as a gamma zero. And then you have a rate and temperature dependent dissipation, which uh, can be in principle obtained from linear viscoelastic material. And there will be a, a small zone here where linear visco either linear viscoelasticity does not really hold, or indeed you could have a zone of molecular fracture. So I've been arguing uh, for a while that uh, this really uh, this zone of molecular fracture was not uh, that small, and that really should be incorporated in the model. So uh, if you look at experiments, though, it's not that obvious. I mean, indeed. Uh, fracture energy, uh, this is data from Alan Gent from 96. Uh, if you look at the data, different temperatures, you can build a master curve. You can use actually the, the shift factors 
to superpose this data into this that worked for linear rheology. So you could really say, well, linear rheology is important to explain this uh, dependence of G as a function of RT. And uh, so in principle, you could build a model uh, with that. And this type of model has have been built uh, using linear rheology. This is an older version by Dejean, much more qualitative, where he uh, was arguing that uh, indeed you could explain the rate dependence of fracture in that way from linear rheology, and, and he predicted some dependence. There is a, a much better description in a, a nice uh, review paper by Bo Person and also another paper where uh, he explains how you could predict fracture energy from mu prime and mu double prime from the linear viscoelastic property. However, you still need an adjustable parameter. If you want to really match uh, quantitatively uh, your, your data, you need an adjustable length scale to, to see where is your dissipation. And it's not really something you can verify. In some cases, this adjustable parameter is not very physical. This is an argument that Jen had done. You, you can use it but it doesn't really make sense. So it suggests that somehow, indeed, some part of the uh, dissipated energy in fracture is missing if you just try to use linear viscoelasticity. So we, we had this question, can you separate the two on breakage now that we have the tool and how does it vary with fracture energy? So we picked a uh, two model system, but I'm going to show you one first. So this polymet, this PMA uh, uh, means uh, methyl acrylate. So this is a network that has a glass transition around 18 degrees C, so pretty close to room temperature, meaning that it's, uh, it's actually pretty viscoelastic at room temperature. It's very, uh, and then as you increase the temperature, you go from 20 to 40 to 60, it becomes less and less viscoelastic. We can characterize the linear viscoelastic property, the, the, the storage and the loss modulus, and this is as a function of frequency in the range of frequency that we're using. This is as a function of temperature at fixed frequency. And these are linear measurements, just uh, from, uh, from uh, DMA at one hertz, or this is from the rheometer. So this, this is done uh, through, through time temperature. Uh, now, if we go to fracture. So we, we did very simple uh, fracture experiment. Uh, we were not really uh, using pure shear samples not because it's not good, and I'm, I'm telling this if any students are listening, but because uh, our experiment, our uh, samples are expensive to make, uh, it takes time. So uh, using simple uh, edge notch sample was easier in terms of uh, conserving material. And we were getting a very similar uh, information. So this is now a test on notch sample. You can see a nominal stress versus stretch. Uh, a different uh, pulling rate and different stretch rate. These are nominal stretch rates. So it's uh, divided by the, the length of the sample. And from this, we can extract the crack velocity. So we can see how fast the crack propagates. It's not constant, but we can have an average crack propagation velocity. And you can see that as you increase the stretch rate, you have a clear increase in the point where the fracture starts to propagate. And you can also see that if you keep the stretch rate constant, but you change the temperature from 25 degrees here to 80, the point where the crack starts to propagate changes dramatically. And, and the material, one would say, becomes more and more brittle as you increase the temperature. So of course, our, our question, this is a well-known result. We just reproduce uh, results that have been obtained in the literature uh, for all kinds of, of elastomers. So it's nothing. Uh, nothing surprising there. But now, of course, we have our tool to detect bond scission. So <coughs> first of all, if we look at the scaling of the fracture energy, we get a, a relatively normal scaling. Here we, uh, we temp time temperature shift the data. So the temperature uh, that are taken at different, uh, uh, the, sorry, the data that is taken at different temperatures, 20 to 80 degree, we are using linear viscoelastic shift factor to uh, actually create a fracture master curve. And this is what you see uh, over here. So these data points have been taken at room temperature at the higher uh, fracture energy. And the one at the bottom here are more the high temperature data. So we are using the approximation of Greensmith. So we, we take the, 
the integral under the stress strain curve up to the fracture point. A very simple way to get the fracture energy. Certainly, you could uh, use a, a better one. Now, if you look at the molecular damage, uh, if we look at um, uh, these raw data from the confocal microscopy, uh, you can see that the rate has a moderate effect, but has an effect. This is low rate, high rate. And at the bottom, you have the low temperature at, on the right and the, low and the high temperature on the left. You can see that at high temperature, the amount of bond scission is much, much less. Now, in a way, if you are thinking of the bond itself, this is a little surprising because uh, bonds have a higher chance to break uh, at higher temperature. So if you pull on a chemical bond itself, uh, you would expect it to break a little bit sooner at higher temperature. But here in this experiment, we see much less bond breakage at higher temperature. Uh, the quantification, I'm just showing one slide. Uh, this is taken from the paper that just shows you uh, what happens if you have here the cracked surface. So this is the interface. Uh, here it says air, but for the measurement, it's glycerol. You have here the, uh, the signal as a function of the cracked surface. You can average that over the propagating crack. You can see that for these kind of cracks in simple material, it's quite straight. So it's, it's good, it's easy to average. And here on the left, you see the volume fracture, the number of the mechanophore broken. So this is the concentration of broken mechanophore which corresponds to the concentration of broken chains as a function of distance from the fracture plane, you can see that there is a pretty large difference between the 25 degree, which is the blue curve, and the 80 degree, which is the red curve. So very different in terms of bond scission. Uh, if you plot now the data in a quantitative way, you, you can plot this relative to the Lake Thomas prediction. And you can see that we get between 8 and 80 times the Lake Thomas prediction. Even at 80 degrees, uh, we still break significantly more than a monolayer in terms of uh, bond breakage. So we're not yet uh, at a, a threshold condition at that temperature. But you can see that the power law, I mean, if you, if you remember the data on the fracture energy, uh, it doesn't look very different. And, and I, I'm going to, to, uh, to actually give you more comparisons later. I'll just note that indeed the damage increases with a roughly a power law uh, as a function of ATV. The blue here is the temperature data. The purple is the strain rate data. Now, if you look at the distance, I, we were not going to do anything with that, but it gives you an idea. Uh, it goes from about 30 micron to 200 micron. So this region and the distance is defined, if I go back to the previous slide, sorry, the distance is defined here to the point where the signal goes to the noise. So it's not an average, it's not a full width half maximum, it's just a maximum distance. So it's a bit larger than what you would use if you use a different definition. So just to keep in mind that in the bond breakage is over a layer, which is of the order of 10th of micron, and you detect much more than a molecular layer in terms of bond scission. Now, uh, the next question that I certainly had was, uh, how about the bond itself? Is it because the physicists tell us that it should be rate and temperature sensitive? It makes sense. I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at this uh, classic paper by Evan Evans and, and co-worker from 97, uh, they show with very elegant single molecule experiment that uh, if you apply a force to the bond, these are weak bonds, so they, they actually get good sensitivity, you can actually change the force. So the force should be defined as a function of the, the actual speed at which you're loading. And of course, the temperature is going to change the whole activation uh, energy uh, landscape. So there should be a difference, but in our experiment, we, we see the exact opposite. In a way, when we go at high temperature, we break less bonds. So obviously this is not true, but we should do a cleaner experiment. So what we did is we, uh, we took our network and we embedded them into a stretchable matrix. And now by pulling the stretchable matrix, you can load the polymer chains without breaking the sample. So you can actually do some statistics. So we, we did these experiments. And uh, here you're looking at the activation of mechanophore in these materials as a function of stretch. Uh, now, again, these are the embedded materials for three different strain rates. So the low strain rate is yellow, 
intermediate is purple and here the green is the fast train rate. Now this point has some, is something different. I think it's a different experiment. But roughly we don't see within these two decades a lot of difference in the strain rate in terms of probability of breaking. When we did the experiment as a function of temperature, it's not quite true. We see an increase. If we look at the 80 degree sample, the, the sample breaks sooner. So we don't have as many points. But 60 degree, you can see that there is a difference in activation. So indeed, the material, uh, the, the bond itself activates a little more when you increase the temperature. But it would even uh, increase the difference that we're seeing in our fracture experiments and the, and the rate dependence during the fracture. So, so the answer there is indeed, we don't find unphysical results, uh, but they do, certainly do not explain our fracture results. Uh, one thing we did, we thought, OK, what, what if we uh, go to a different elastomer? So if we use a, an elastomer with a lower TG, uh, in this case, minus 20 degree, uh, can we do the same measurement? And here we can see that if we shift the data to account for the different TG, so we shift by 40 degrees the data. Uh, now we, we do the experiments at higher temperature relative to TG. And indeed, we break much less bonds. So, so in a way, these two materials can almost go on the same line. They are different. They have different entanglements. So they shouldn't really necessarily be on top of each other. But, but we see that the, the general trend uh, is the same. We, we are going towards some sort of threshold, which actually, this is actually not, this is not gamma. It's a mistake uh, of mine. It's, uh, it's the uh, sigma over sigma t, it's, uh, it's sigma bar that we're, we're seeing here. So it's, uh, it's the number of broken bonds. Now, uh, another thing that we looked at is this uh, important result from Lake and Thomas, which is uh, the cross-linking effect. If you change the chain length, uh, you also change sigma. So uh, you're actually uh, making chains longer, which should dissipate more energy, but you have less chains per unit area. So in the end, actually, gamma increases with nx to the 1 half. So you would expect that the softer material to be uh, more, to have a higher fracture energy in threshold condition. We, we did that with our material with two different crossing density. And there's about a factor of two. You can see that actually in terms of gamma, we find a result that everybody else finds, which is the softer material actually has a higher fracture energy. Now, how about breaking bonds? If we look at bond breakage in the material, do we see uh, an effect? And the answer is, of course, it's very noisy, but it looks more like our uh, less crossing material breaks less bonds. And also, I, OK, here, a parallel line, I, we can argue. I mean, we, we definitely need probably more data. But it looks like this effect is really true over the whole range of velocity. So it's just not that threshold. So it means that. Uh, somehow the less cross-linking also affects viscoelastic dissipation. It doesn't only affect threshold condition. Now, let me try to summarize the data we have. Uh, in this uh, cartoon here, in this graph, where I show here uh, the energy that we expect to dissipate by bond scission. So this is sigma, so the number of chains per unit area times n, so the length of the chain. So, so in a way, uh, this is uh, the, the energy that you expect to break, uh, the, the energy that you expect to spend by breaking. The only thing that's missing is the energy per bond, the UV, which we did not put in here. Now, if uh, traditional models were correct, this should be a constant. So, so this value here, this, uh, this band down here, uh, sigma NLT is the prediction if we are constant. Now you can see that uh, indeed the energy due to bond scission increases with rate uh, and increases at different rates depending on the material. The red one is the more cross-linked uh, high TG one. Uh, the blue one is the low TG. And the green one is the less cross-linked. So there's definitely a coupling between the viscoelastic behavior and the network structure, which seems to come from this, which for us was a surprise. I'm not saying we understand it, but it's something that uh, we are really looking into. As I said in the introduction, 
I'm quite curious to see how you can affect uh, macroscopic properties with molecular structures. And, and so here we learn something about which molecular structure works better than others. But <coughs> another way to plot the data is to look at the fraction of energy uh, due to damage or to bond scission relative to total energy. So uh, in this case, we have to assume uh, an energy per bond. So here I took the 60 kilojoule per mole of Steve Craig's paper. Uh, and if we do that, we see that there is a clear trend that when you go to, from high velocity, so high viscoelastic dissipation to low velocity, uh, the fraction of energy due to bond scission increases. Uh, but it does increase with different rates. So, so clearly, the details of the uh, network structure matters in terms of uh, the importance that bond scission has for the overall fracture energy, which is not something uh, completely obvious to us. But you can still see the clear trend. Uh, so, so there is a transition between uh, a regime close to the glass transition where viscoelastic dissipation dominates to a regime when you go far from the glass transition where bond scission starts to dominate. And, and the transition is indeed continuous. So this is because uh, the energy due to bond scission increases less rapidly than the viscoelastic friction. So seeing all these results, what sort of picture can we have? And, and now I, I'm bringing a cartoon to try to explain our vision, but it's, it's again, it's hypothetic. And, and it, it, uh, I think it, it is close to some of the arguments that uh, Bo Person had in his review which is if you want to propagate uh, your uh, crack faster in a viscoelastic medium, uh, you need more energy uh, to actually propagate it faster. So if you want to use more energy, the only way to get that is to increase the uh, opening of the crack. So you need to deform your material to increase your applied energy release rate to actually move the crack faster. Now this increase in G and this increase in crack opening because here we have a strain field also increases the stretch. So, so the, the probability of breaking bonds then increases. And uh, of course the highest stresses are still close to the center. So you're going to have actually a regime here uh, where you're going to have high stresses. Now in, in uh, this type of materials is not really a point singularity. You have a singularity in the propagation direction, but in the perpendicular direction, it's not really a singularity. So you have really a region of high stresses, which increases and high strains, and these high strains increase the probability of breakage. So there is really, I think the picture we have is that there is a synergy between the viscoelastic dissipation, which slows down crack growth, forces you for a given speed to increase the opening, and this increase in opening dissipates energy to bond scission. And, and I think that this is a, uh, a reasonable view. Now, uh, I finish with two perspective uh, examples. So we are very interested in the technique, uh, not only for a fracture in, in simple network, but also because you can really have a 3D visualization zone for damage zone. So right now, uh, Gabriel Sanoa, who is a postdoc working in my group, is working on here a crack propagation problem where you can see that the, the crack is not really going straight. It deviates, it has side cracks. And uh, with post-mortem observation, you can really quantify. So here, this A and B corresponds to profile, uh, starting from the crack face towards the internal. You can see how the intensity fluctuates. This can be integrated point by point along the arc. And then you can have a local damage per unit length here as a function of arc length. So you can see that, indeed, as the crack propagates, in more uh, in tougher material, more complex propagation condition, it's something that varies spatially and temporally. So the crack is not necessarily moving in a well-behaved way. But we can at least, I'm not saying we can predict, but we can certainly see it and characterize. And the second example here is, uh, I think for me, another fascinating case is cavitation, the explosive decompression. You saturate the rubber with gas, and then uh, once it's saturated, you decompress rapidly. This is something that the oil and gas industry does. And uh, then all these cavities close down. So you have no idea that these cavities ever existed. But now if you have mechanophore, you can look at the sample with cavities closed uh, and you can observe and see the shape. 
So one of the things that we found is that these cracks actually have uh, shape that are discs like. They, they do grow as cavities, but the damage zone is very much a disc, like a penny shaped crack. So, uh, and we can, we can look at some of the details of how they grow. So it's really a, a nice uh, tool to understand better how uh, this type of three dimensional fracture problem will work. So to have a, a conclusion slide, uh, I think I try to show you that this Nils Alder adduct mechanophore uh, can report for molecular damage in 3D. There are some difficulties to be quantitative in 3D because of this dependent signal, but I think uh, we can still have a lot of possibilities. Uh, it gives us a much more realistic picture of network failure. Is that is, I would not say that this is a surprise, but I think we at least put numbers in there. Uh, the bond breakage is very much over distances of micron or even tenth of micron, and, and this might help for people trying to develop better models, more, uh, more physically relevant model. Uh, and, and also that the fraction of energy dissipated from bone scission is actually an important fraction. It's not, it's not a negligible fraction, even in a situation where you have uh, quite a bit of viscoelastic dissipation. And, and the final point is uh, maybe more uh, my, my thinking at this point is that uh, molecular friction and bond scission really are synergistic and the high friction also causes increased probability of, uh, of bond breakage. Now, it doesn't seem to be true uh, if you really look at one molecule, but, but in terms of the fracture problem, it's definitely true. So I'd like to just thank now uh, all the people who participated. It's very much a, a teamwork. So first of all, the students. Uh, the first part of the work was done by Yin Jun Chen, very talented student from Xiamen University, chemist. Juliette Slotman uh, did most of the anthracene work together with Victoria Waltz for some of the last uh, experiments. Then the analysis of the data, the optical data was done first by Josh Yeh and then by Jean Conté, who are more physicists by training. And the simulation uh, was done by the group of Rong Long in mechanics. Of course, we plenty of discussion with Hugh Brown early in the stage of the project about this uh, molecular fracture problem. And I'd like also to thank Rin Sibisma and Robert Gustel, uh, who really helped us to learn about synthesizing molecules and, and helped us to interpret the data and to, to do the incorporation in the network. So I think at this stage, uh, I think I would like to stop uh, talking. And uh, of course, I'd be very happy to field uh, any questions. So let hey, me- Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Sharing. Yeah, all right, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Costantino. Really amazing talk. It's very beautiful to be able to see the bond decision, uh, to visualize the stress field and, and, the, and quantify the fracture energy. Um, before we start the Q&A, uh, Teng Li would like to introduce the uh, EML Associate Editors. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank you, Tian, and thank you, uh, Constantino, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, two of my colleagues at Extreme Mechanics Letters, also uh, on this panel, and uh, uh, Professor Jimmy Xia from uh, uh, the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, Jimmy is one of the uh, editor-in-chief of EML, and also uh, Professor Su Lin Zhang from Penn State University, who is also one of the associate editor of uh, Extreme Mechanics Letters. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are going to start the Q&A session. Uh, when uh, I'm, I'm just gonna try to create a queue. Uh, if you want to um, talk, whether you are in the panel or not, you can raise your hand. And I think if you are on the panel, you click the participants and then you can raise your hand inside that. Uh, if you are not on the panel, uh, you can, I think there is a hand shaped button that you can press and it, we will move you to, uh, to the panel. Um, when you ask a question, uh, we ask you to start with uh, your name and your institution. So we will start with Xuan He Zhao. Uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. So uh, really uh, impressive talk and a wonderful, very inspiring talk, uh, Constantino. I truly enjoy it. Uh, so it seems uh, you have done lots of work. 
since our last uh, visit, yes, PCR, uh, really a wonderful work. Uh, now, uh, so the question, I think we discussed this before, uh, uh, for elastomers, uh, the polymer chains are still, uh, you know, entangled, you know, uh, but uh, recently there are uh, developments of this, uh, people call it either ideal network, it's basically a gel with, you know, eco arm lines uh, without the uh, entanglement. Uh, and then there are some uh, study on the, uh, you know, fracture energy on this uh, related to. So uh, can you comment on that? And uh, especially do you see opportunities uh, about a coupling uh, mechanical force to that, uh, uh, you know, network, you know, so that you can have an even simpler or cleaner material system to uh, you You are thinking of the, the network of Sergei Sheiko or uh... The, the bottle I'm brush the system the, of uh, Sakai and uh, you know the ah, 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 Sakai yeah, yeah. so so uh, this kind of network they have a homogeneous chain length so yeah. they are the tetra peg network so uh, they are perfect they are better than the one we have uh, in terms of uh, regularity because the chain length is the same but the biggest um, randomness of the network is not really the chain length, it's the chain conformation. So essentially some chains in the network, they're already pre-stretched, some they are coiled, and this distribution is really a statistical physics. So you will have a distribution of, of uh, sizes to maximize entropy. So even though in, in uh, you know, physics courses, sometimes they say, oh, the chain is Gaussian and there is an end-to-end vector but it's not really uniform. So even in the, the type of network that Sakai um, mm. has made, you have less uh, defects than in our network, but you still have some. Now, uh, if you ask, would, would it be interesting to use this technique uh, in his network? Obviously, I think, yes, it would be interesting to see the effect of this type of randomness. I think for gels, uh, the, the kind of molecule uh, that I've used is a hydrophobic molecule. So to incorporate it into a gel uh, takes a little bit more effort. Maybe you have to make the gel in a hydrophobic solvent, then exchange the solvent uh, and the randomness of the, 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 I think one of the issues is if, if you put a, a hydrophobic molecule in water, they will, I think they will tend to cluster. And if they start clustering, then uh, are you going to get a good signal from it? Uh, is, is not uh, completely obvious to me. If you have a really hydrophilic uh, molecule that gives a signal, maybe there are, I mean, we did not look, I think there is opportunity there. Then uh, I think you could do this in gels. I don't see why not. Wonderful. If I may ask a general question, since I'm teaching mechanics of soft materials this semester, and I got this question from students uh, a lot, uh, also not only to uh, Constantino, to the whole panel, uh, what do you think uh, is the you know, future direction uh, for uh, soft materials, not even mechanics of soft materials, soft materials in general? Mm -hmm. Soft material in general. I think bio, you know, biomedical and biological application, there is still a lot of opportunity, I think, in that area, uh, as you know, because you, you, you are going in that direction. Um, I think uh, at least what we see in Europe, because maybe it's a little bit different in the US, is that sustainable uh, development, recycling, and issues with uh, what are we going to do with the waste uh, are becoming important issues. And I think, of course, conventional elastomers do not recycle very well. So, so I think we start to see topics in that direction. How can you reconcile uh, materials that can be reused or recycled, but still have very good mechanical property? Because you, you, you would like to keep uh, the mechanical property that customers are paying for, but at the same time, uh, say something about recyclability. At least we, we, uh, we see that topic coming. I don't know, uh, you know, from the fundamental point of view, uh, whether there is something for mechanician. I think, I think uh, uh, for chemists, for sure there is. I mean, I think uh, in chemistry there is opportunities, uh, but, but I think there may be some tricks where chemistry and physics uh, join to, to have, uh, let's say, good property, for example, in a range of temperature, and then above a certain temperature, the property really 
uh, disappear or, or decrease and, and you can go into a recycling mode, you know, that, that kind of topic. Uh, but I think the, the, the biomedical for sure is one, but it's already, I think a lot of people are going in that direction. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, Jiga, you have a question next? Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, wonderful talk, of course, as always, <laughs> Constantino. Uh, so one issue um, we discussed, you and I discussed before, uh, I want to ask you again, uh, because you have new tools, the tools become so uh, you're getting uh, more perfect. So. Um, you at this talk focus on uh, fracture energy, meaning, yeah. yeah, the critical condition that you measure when you have a crack, fracture energy. There is also common, even more common quantity measured in engineering. That is, if you have a sample without any crack, and you just pull to rupture, yeah. that's a work of rupture. Now. For very brittle material, glass, that work of rupture is a statistical quantity. It's very hard to study anything. <clears throat> yeah. However, for most elastomers and gels, that quantity is as stable as uh, uh, fracture energy. Yeah. So in principle, you can also measure that, uh, we call W, right? The yeah. work of fracture. And also that work of fracture is orders of magnitude lower than ideal network. Presumably it's a reflection of a statistical nature of the network. So, but it's a constant for given yeah, material, yeah. it's a very good constant. So, no, no, it's true. I, 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 uh, I, I completely agree with you that, uh, you know, for many materials, this work of, uh, you know, if you do just tensile test, yeah. Uh, you don't have, even though you might tell students, if you're in fracture mechanics, you say, oh, it's much better to do a, a fracture mechanics test. It will be more reproducible. But if you actually try to do the experiment, it's not always more reproducible. You, you, it, it's not the same quantity, but uh, I think the way I look at this W is that uh, the material is able to create its own defects. So its own intrinsic defects. And we need to understand uh, what's the mechanism. I mean, how, because in the end, you, you still break the sample with cracks, except yeah. that they are not there to start with, but they will nucleate. And in the end, when, you, when the sample breaks in your tensile test, it will be with a crack. Uh, you just don't know where, so you, you cannot film it, but, but it's still a crack. And I think uh, uh, to me, the big question is uh, why, uh, what causes this crack to initiate uh, and and uh, if it's reproducible it suggests that you reach some kind of critical uh, let's say stored elastic energy or you and and then that causes the crack to to nucleate but i think it's a it's a very good fundamental problem i think that we have not i i don't think people have done but now you are right with the tools we have uh it, there might be some opportunity. The, the problem is that if you if you do this experiment without any notch, uh, you will you you cannot really look at the crack as it nucleates. You can only look at the broken sample. So then uh, it's about detecting something from the broken sample. But we did not look, for example, for other defects uh, in in a broken sample because maybe uh, you nucleate many defects and only one propagates into a crack. It's possible. Can I ask a follow-up question, uh, just directly related to this? So uh, the central mystery to me is uh, this W, essentially the stress-strain curve area under that curve up to fracture. That number is a very stable number for polymer and for metal, not a terrible number for, for glass. Uh, so, so the central mystery is for elastomer that number, this area under the curve is order magnitude lower than ideal network. So yeah. basically most polymers are not engaged upon fracture. So that's one. The second one, even more important to engineering than fracture energy itself, 
is uh, this W has a unit of energy per volume. Mm. Fracture energy has energy per area. So these two, the ratio of these two value give you a high quality lens scale. We start to call it a fractal cohesive lens. It's a material yeah. constant, highly, highly stable lens and very useful number in engineering, even more useful than fracture energy itself. Now, but again, we have no clue, some clue. So I was thinking your new tool can shed light, a typical number, for example, for our uh, polyacrylamide gel, it doesn't matter you, how you make it, it's about one millimeter. This uh, length, mm -hmm. much larger than uh, mesh size. Where does this lens come yeah. from? So I hope your tool can shed light on, on this fundamental question. So both scientifically intriguing and engineering in terms of engineering, just a zero order importance. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, that's true. I mean, I think this question of nucleation and, and the notch sensitivity, I mean, uh, uh, when, wh why, what controls notch sensitivity? Yeah. And, uh, ob and, and it is quite different depending on the material. So you, you are right that it, it looks like a material property. Yeah. It's not completely true because if you, if you change the method to make the sample, I mean, you can have edge defects that still but, but you, in general, I agree with you. And, yeah. uh, and we don't really know uh, what uh, feature of the material controls this kind of uh, uh, length scale. You can see it as a length scale, but I, I would say more, I like the W better as a, I mean, if W is a material property, then, uh, then there is a reason for this W. Then yeah. uh, that means that material is able to nucleate its own defects. And there must be a nucleation volume on, some some level at which heterogeneity becomes important, but uh, I think there is a, there there is a need to have a way of thinking about this kind of problem. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, and next uh, we have a question from Steve. Steve Clay. Hey, Constantino. Let me uh, just add how how wonderful that talk was to what everyone else has said and, and thought. Um, I've got lots of questions, but the maybe the one I'll I'll ask is. Um, so this dependence on strain rate and role of viscoelasticity, I think qualitatively, I get it. One of the one of the pieces I can't quite wrap my head around, kind of quantitatively, is 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 it understood how I should think about the strain rate at the actual tip of the propagating crack? Yeah, it, th th this strikes me as an incredibly complex dynamic question, and and then if if you ag agree with that, I wonder if some of these tools that you're using can't are there are there ways to to go and and actually experimentally back out effective strain rates as a function of you know kind of where my pixel is relative to the yeah, no, I see. I see your crack. point. Okay, let me let me give you uh, my opinion on 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 the experiment. I mean, if you start to go close to the crack tip, uh, every crack is different. So you know, when when you see uh, the crack of a of a, a mechanical model, it looks like a nice crack, you know, with a nice. Uh, <laughs> but an experimental crack doesn't look like that, and particularly not for this type of soft material. It's a 3D structure. Uh, it's not very reproducible. Every crack is different. So this is for sure. I mean, initially I had a similar idea. We have to go very close to the crack tip. We have the tools. We have the resolution. We're going to look very close. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that if you look very close, you, you have a different problem, which is how do I average my data? Because every crack will be completely different. Uh, and so how do you, what do you measure? And this is why in a way I showed you this post-mortem data because the post-mortem data is much more reproducible. And uh, then we can say some things about propagation by looking uh, directly at the tip of the crack uh, in a way that, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, Zhigang was right. These macroscopic properties are pretty reproducible. So it's, it's not an issue of, uh, but, but on the other hand, each crack is different. So, so uh, 
now if you want to do measurement at that small length scale, you have to think wh what's the relevant way, how, how do I average things properly? Uh, and so there are, I think, experimental difficulty. You can think of it theoretically, I mean, for sure. I mean, uh, the crack moves at a certain speed. So you know what the strain field should be. At least you have models for that. So you can actually calculate the strain rate as a function of position. But then to, mo to map that into a real crack uh, and to get some, let's say, a bond scission measurement, or that would be uh, yeah, more, uh, more difficult to be convincing. Hey. Thank you. Um, uh, next, I would invite uh, Robin Bai to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, thank yes. you, Dr. Tang. Uh, hi, Professor Kratong. Uh, nice to see you. And uh, I've been a big fan of you for a while. I work with Shigang <laughs> and now at Caltech. I'll be moving to Boston, back to Boston in January and Northeastern to start a faculty. So it's it's nice that uh, Dr. Uh, Craig asked that question. That was one of my questions. So I. I can ask a follow-up question. So you mentioned a little bit about crack speed. So how about that? I mean, I, for, from, from my experience, I'd like to connect some theoretical modeling or thinking to experimental characterization. Yeah. Then what about such as your uh, adhesion job? How about using a, a peeling test or tear test? Then I can, more or less map my loading speed or loading rate to the crack speed, right? So that's my first question. And mm -hmm. the second question is about the molecule you, uh, you, uh, you have been using. Yeah. So <clears throat> many of these molecules such as ferroparent, they are also, uh, they can also undergo photochemistry. So my question is, can we use some? Uh, can we use photochemistry as a way to do some measurement or even tuning of the, for example, fracture of these uh, materials? I know the percentage is very low that is activated in your network, but can we can we imagine to use some of them? Thank you. Okay, so uh, the question I I don't remember the first one now, but the second question about the photochemistry. You are completely right. I think uh, many of these molecules can be activated uh, by, by light or by UV. And uh, I think it's an open, it's a wide open field. I think uh, uh, I don't know enough about photochemistry to really have the clever ideas myself. But I think there are many chemists who, who really uh, tr try to do things with the molecules to get responsive behavior to, to actually have, a, because of course, light, I mean, radiation, you can, you can, uh, you can do some mapping, you can use masks. So, so there's also some tools that you can use. So, uh, but for sure, in my case, I, was, I wanted to use the molecule as a marker. So to understand the material behavior. So I use a very small amount. I, the idea was not to change the material properties uh, with the molecule, but there are other people who do that. So uh, I think that's uh, for sure true. Now, can you just briefly remind me of the first Press question? Speed. Crack oh, yes. Uh, the cra and what about crack speed? So uh, how about using crack speed? <laughs> and uh, uh, Oh, yes, can... the peeling, the peeling. Yeah, peeling. Um, I, think, I think peeling is an interest. I mean, to, to use mechanophore in peeling is an interesting experiment in its own right. So I mean, uh, I think any material where you could use the peeling, uh, you would also get some nice information about the importance of bond scission in peeling. So I think. Uh, is a very much uh, an interesting experiment. I think using peeling versus, uh, you know, crack propagation, I think depends on the material. I mean, some some materials, uh, because peeling means you have to worry about the stretching of the peeling arm. So if you have a very stretchable material, then stretching the peeling arm, particularly if you had nonlinear stretching, it becomes complicated to to uh, to really evaluate your your uh, your energy balance, but. I don't see why not. I mean, I think uh, maybe getting a peeling sample is very expensive for your case. Well, yeah, not the ones we uh, we use. I mean, I think the biggest difficulty is that uh, if you want to use this kind of molecule, you have to think how to incorporate the molecule in the material you want. So you definitely need some thinking in terms of chemistry. You, 
I think collaboration with the chemistry group, in my opinion, is uh, if you if you're from the physics mechanics side, is necessary. I mean, you because you can copy chemistry, and after a while, you know, if your students are good, they they should be okay. Even, uh, but but developing new chemistry uh, with a really new idea, I mean, uh, this is a different job. You, you really need a chemistry group for that. And this is the limitation of this type of method. You change material, you have to think about how to incorporate your molecule in the in the right way. There, there can be toolboxes. So I think with time, I think chemists will develop the right kind of toolbox that can be used for different problems. And, uh, and then uh, we'll be able to collaborate and maybe someday uh, buy them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have uh, Shi Ching Wang who would like to add some yes. comments on sustainability. So if I could ask you to start with uh, your institution, uh, just introduce yourself and your institution. Hi, Shi Ching. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So yeah. Hi, Constino. Uh, this is Shi Ching Wang from the uh, University of Accra. I'm a, a polymer physicist. Uh, yeah, I would just quickly comment on uh, Constino's question about sustainability. It's a it's the future of polymer science, and which is a big part of my, uh, soft material. Uh, it's also a big deal in this country. And uh, you, you talked about what we can do about it. Well, whatever sustainable polymer you are proposing to make, it will be a empty promise if we don't have strong mechanical properties. <laughs> yeah, Period. for sure. So, uh, so for that reason, I'm, I'm highly motivated to be part of uh, this community, trying to work on the mechanics of mm. polymeric materials. No, that you're class. right. You, you, you're right that there will be opportunities in that direction. For and sure. as you know, uh, PRA and PHB, they are all brittle and very poor property, have very yeah. poor property. So we need to know the mechanical, uh, the molecular yeah, there mechanics. May be, there may be ways to really do better. And I think if we understand the, I think there is an opportunity to study this. When you completely change material, then you have to worry again about mechanical property. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so Constino, I, I waited uh, since I visited you last October for your talk, meaning for, for your <laughs> new progress. Uh, I just have two very naive, uh, 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 should I say suggestion or, or question rather. I, do you have any plan to, as as uh, Jagan pointed out, I, do you have any plan to go into glassy polymer, you know, in glassy? State? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, the, that's the, the whole a issue point. of uh, of toughness. You know, for example, styrene. If you have a brittle film, yeah. Man, I, 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 your your message today is incredible. That uh, you are very gentle on this, but basically you're telling us, of course, the 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 the, the failure involves multiple layers of molecules, mm -hmm. right? Unlike Tom, uh, like Thomas's view of a, a single layer, sort of, right? And, and styrene, when you break it, I'm intrigued whether that involves just a couple of layers or not. So that's my number one question. Uh, number two, uh, very quickly, is you are aware, even in a case where you have no cross-linking, just entanglement, okay, an entangled melt. Yeah. To stretch it sufficiently fast, it will break very, very sharply, like a piece of glass. Yeah. I wonder in that limit, what you find is not true. In other words, it, it probably just involves one or two layers because just yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What? That I, I would not. I we, we are trying. I mean, there are some some practical uh, issue about doing the experiment because I think to really do this kind of experiment uh, properly. I think you need highly entangled polymers. And uh, so we need uh, some modification in the chemistry, but I, I'm not uh, losing uh, hope to do that experiment. Um, I would not bet that in the case of highly entangled polymer melt, that the, the, the I, I agree with you that some bonds will be broken, but I would think it would be quite diffuse. I don't think it will be uh, that localized, but this is uh, just my personal feeling so uh, it's not really worth uh, mm -hmm. if i if i have experiments i will on the polystyrene question i think one of the things that uh, i find uh, fascinating with mechanophore is that you can see uh, you can see bond scission into a transparent material it's completely transparent if you look at it with a normal optical microscope you don't see anything 
you don't see any damage at all. Now, if you try to break polystyrene, you, as you well know, you have crazes, you have localized plasticity, which is quite visible with other techniques. I mean, you, you can use regular microscopy. Now, uh, if the question is, uh, do you have bone scission in polystyrene outside of the craze? Uh, that could be a, a, an interesting question. And also another question could be uh, inside the craze. Uh, is the craze uh, an, an event that requires bone scission? If you have an uncrosslink polymer or not, so so this would be a, a question that uh, you, you could ask for the for the glassy polymer. But somehow I'm a little more fascinated by the elastomer problem. But uh, I think the glassy problem would be. I, I so far people have have used it in glassy polymer to detect plasticity, and you know I think there are other methods if you just want to detect plasticity. Uh, so so uh, I think. The, the, the problem there, I think, is the spatial resolution. To be able to really look inside the craze, which is what you would like to do, uh, then a conventional optical microscopy, uh, you, you would really need to think about super resolution or some, some trick to, to improve the, the, resolu the spatial resolution, because the problems are at much smaller scale. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I invite uh, uh, Professor Bob Pearson. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. A very nice presentation. Um, I have a question. You, have, you are studying cohesive crack propagation. You have very big stresses. You break chemical bonds inside the material. But if you look at adhesive crack, you have much smaller stresses and probably you are not breaking any chemical bonds, but still this viscoelastic factor is basically the same. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting to compare adhesive crack propagation with the cohesive crack propagation and sort of extract out? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, see, I see your point. Uh, I think, okay, I think you have to distinguish two types of adhesive crack propagation, because if you uh, use, if you're thinking of rubbers, uh, if, of course, you can have uh, just a, a Van der Waals adhesion, yeah. uh, and in this case, it's hard. I mean, is there any bond scission when you have Van der Waals adhesion in rubber? That would be an interesting problem. It, it, probably not conventional wisdom, you would think not, but if the stresses are high enough, maybe there could be some bond breakage even uh, in a Van der Waals type adhesion. If the adhesion, you know, if you go very close to TG, you have uh, very high dissipation, the stresses are high, local deformation will be high. So you might get the same type of breakage in the bulk that you have. You may, maybe not, you don't need to break at the interface, but what I'm showing is more breakage in the bulk due to, to deformation close to the crack tip. So this high deformation close to the crack tip, I think you would have it also in an adhesive uh, debonding if you, if you are in the high, uh, high fracture energy regime. So yeah, I don't think it, it should not be so different. Okay, but you will see that in your experiment. You will find. I will see that in my experiment. No, it's a it's a it's a very good suggestion. I mean, I think uh, we should try that. It's a very good suggestion. We we should uh, we should try to do uh, this type of debonding experiment with Rob. I didn't think of it, but I think it's a very it's a very nice experiment to try. Good. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manoj, you had a question? Yes. Uh, first of all, Constantino, uh, uh, again, as usual, an excellent talk. I, uh, you can hear me, right? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, I, I just uh, have a, a question, actually two. One, the first one is about this huge discrepancy of the energy needed to break the bond. 60, 60 kilojoules hmm. per mole to versus 300, right? And yeah. that, and now you, you pointed out uh, this paper of Rubinstein, Craig, and others. I have not yes. seen that paper. I yeah, yeah. Like, but I, I, I want to mention uh, or point out that uh, this kind of, uh, you know, <clears throat> the uh, 
Sparling and Tobolsky pointed out uh, uh, that uh, many, many years ago, of course, that the bond, breaking of bond in elastomeric system is autocatalytic. That is, suppose you have, a, we know in siloxin system, mm -hmm. you break a bond, you form silicon oxygen that is minus and silicon plus. And this, what happens is that this uh, negative charge group begin to backbite the chain and then it forms cyclics and then uh, it never stops. It keeps on going for, for a long period of time. So that effectively, you know, it, uh, I mean, it appears that the activation energy is low, but it is, a, it, it, I mean, this is a result of auto uh, catalytic propagation of mm -hmm. bond, bond season. And uh, I mean, in the case of siloxin, uh, I think we have, uh, our own work has, is consistent with what Sparling and Tobolsky suggested. Uh, but in, in the case of uh, other uh, polymer, I mean, uniform free radicals, and same kind of uh, process may also continue. And so the, is this something of consideration in your studies that uh, uh huh. Yeah, you you are asking about what happens to the free radicals, basically. If you yeah. if you break, you you have homolytic scission, and then uh, you have free radicals going around. And these free radicals, I mean, people have done some experiments, in particular in jumping gongs group, where in the absence of oxygen, the free radical can restart the polymerization. If you have polymer and you have no oxygen, uh, in the presence of oxygen, though, the free radical, I'm not sure that there will be, uh, a, you know, the, the, the life of the free radical will be long, but I think it's an unexplored issue. Uh, and it may be explained some differences between uh, different polymers, because indeed uh, this will be very dependent on the details of the chemistry uh, to, to see what, what happens after the reaction, whether the reactive uh, groups that you created through the bond breakage, are they going to be active someplace else or uh, modify, uh, adapt the property of the material. I haven't seen much uh, discussion about that for conventional elastomers, but uh, uh, may maybe it's uh, to be studied. You're, you're right that it's something to keep in mind, we, which we basically ignore. At this stage, we're saying, okay, once the bond is broken, is broken and nothing else happens, but it may not be true. Okay, that's great. So the, the other one is really, the other question is very really short. I mean, uh, are there this kind of mechanophore, mechanochromophore, uh, fluorescent probe uh, for water, water soluble system? Uh, I think there are some, I mean, maybe Stephen is, is uh, has more information if he's still here. And, but, but I've seen some papers. Uh, so many people are now looking into making new mechanophores and I would think that because fluorescent molecules are widely used in biology in water, uh, so there might be some, some variation that are uh, uh, water soluble enough uh, to be fluorescent. You need to pick the right structure. I, uh, right now we are writing a review uh, together with Rin Sibesma and uh, my, my student, my former student who's now working with him told me that he found some good candidates. So uh, uh, I, we, we didn't have much luck. When we tried to adapt our hydrophobic system to water, the yield was very low. Uh, the signal was poor. Uh, it, we, we had some difficulty. So I, I, so far, I cannot really report in our group a good uh, detection with mechanophores in gels or in water. But I don't see why it should not be possible. Someone will come up with the good okay. idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ri Huang, Professor Ri Huang, want to ask a question? Sure, thank you very much, Tian. Uh, thank you, Constantine. I, I enjoyed the talk very, very much. Uh, this is something I'm very interested in. Especially, I think I want to ask a question about this effect of viscoelasticity. And you have very nice pictures showing that, that the rate change is the sort of the area of viscoelasticity and to change that may affect the effect energy. Mm. I suppose you, as you, I don't know if you have probably answered this question before, uh, you're mostly focusing on uh, elastomers. Uh, meaning the material normally uh, uh, above the glass in temperature. 
Now, what happens, and uh, some uh, ask uh, this same question in glass in polymer, does, do you think viscal artistic still have a role to play there other than some other uh, effect like increasing or plasticity? Mm, well, I think, I think, you know, in glassy polymer, elasticity is typically not very rate dependent. So, but the modulus changes a bit with temperature, but not, not usually, but plasticity is more rate dependent. So for sure, uh, you, you do have some rate dependence also in glassy polymer and temperature dependent, but it's less uh, obvious than for elastomers. I think uh, uh, there is less studies and uh, you have to get close to the glass transition to really see uh, uh, significant differences. But the yielding, for example, the yield stress uh, depends very much on temperature, uh, depends on rate. So these are some well-known uh, uh, well questions. But whether our tools can help you to understand yielding, because uh, the, the bonds, I mean, one of the important things in elastomer is that uh, you have weak bonds and strong bonds. So somehow your mechanophore is incorporated into the strong bonds. The Van der Waals bonds are very weak. So you, the stress is really only carried by the strong bonds. But in a, in a classic polymer, the stress is carried by Eric by friction because you, you're below the glass transition. So all the, the Van der Waals bonds carry stress. So your, your covalent bonds, yes, they are stronger energetically, but uh, all the bonds carry stress. So, so you're somehow the signal on the, on the chemical bond is not telling you, I think that much about macroscopic stress. I, I can be wrong on this, but uh, I think the, the I'm not sure that the, the force will be high enough to activate the molecule if you put it into a glass. I mean, certainly experimentally, people who have incorporated mechanophore in glasses, they see activation when there is plasticity. Right. So now, if I may, a uh, follow-up question with this uh, viscoelasticity fact. Uh, given uh, in some cases, maybe the material is, uh, has a large area of viscoelasticity. In that case, uh, how do you determine this um, energy release rate of fracture energy either by experiments or modeling? Because you have oh, to you mean when the, the, when the material is very viscoelastic? Right. Uh, yeah, we, that, that's a good point. I mean, we, we really should be uh, uh, using, let's say, unloading curves and, and be more careful with the, uh, with the calculation of the energy release rate. In this particular case, we, we just use, the, let's say, the standard method, which is just using the loading curve and look at the energy under the loading curve. But I think in viscoelastic material, we overestimate the energy release rate because you're losing some energy during loading. So, so uh, the, the really the, the correct way to do it would be to, to do loading unloading and to use the unloading curve on unnotched sample to actually get the energy release rate and then to use the extensibility at break from the notch sample and the unloading curve from the unnotched. But again, it, it requires more samples, but that would be the right way to do it in my opinion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Su Lin, you had a question? Sure, thanks, Tian. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Creighton. Uh, nice talk. Uh, enjoyed it. So I have a, uh, um, I have a, uh, by the way, I'm a, one of the uh, associate editors for Extreme Mechanics Letters. Uh, so uh, thanks for giving the wonderful uh, talk. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so I have a technical question uh, for you. Uh, you in, in biological field, people using this uh, traction force microscopy, meaning that they embed fluorescent beads into gels to track the displacement so that the tracked forces. Yeah. I would like to have you to comment the differences, pros and cons of your method and this kind of particle-based mechanical in biology. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in biology, typically the magnitude of the forces are much smaller. So, so uh, they are really looking to detect very small forces. Uh, and I think the, the, that's the main difference in the method. So they don't really have to worry about uh, connecting the mechanophore to a network, but they, they need weak connections. And indeed, uh, they, they measure displacement in this case. They use, they use the mechanophore as a spring with a very uh, low spring constant, and they measure the displacement and from the displacement, then they, they get the force because they, 
they really want to measure very small for. So it's a it's a different, I think, method. To, to we we are looking in materials, uh -huh. we are looking for much stronger for. But it, it depends on the detail of the method. Though. So you think that for particle based uh, mechanical for cannot be uh, cannot measure large displacement. Uh, I think in, in material science, usually particles, you know, fluorescent particles can be used for different things, like, for example, measuring a displacement field. So this would be a, a DIC, digital image correlation type method. I think for that, uh, I think it works very well. Uh, for measuring forces directly, uh, then, then you need to have some idea of the elasticity of your uh, your local elasticity of your material. The particle itself is not going to measure uh, a force. Sure. A follow-up question is that uh, you know, living cell, a living cell is made of a lot, made of a lot of polymers, right? Yeah. And you see that you can use your mechanical force to track the mechanical forces inside a cell. Ah, uh, this is something that people are very interested in doing, but you 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 need to find a very sensitive mechanical force. That, that will have an optical signal with a very small force. So, so this, I think, I think there are in the chemistry field, I'm pretty sure that there are uh, synthetic groups that are looking into that because uh, I think it's, uh, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting development to have much more sensitive mechanophore system that would be reacting to very tiny forces. Yeah, but there would be different molecules. For sure, there would be completely different molecules. Yeah, a lot of people tried but failed. It's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, this is also my conclusion that so far this is work for synthetic chemistry group, and uh, it's too early for people like us who are doing mechanical property to to get into that. Once once they find something really good, uh, then okay. then I think it's a it's a very good problem. There's no doubt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Dylan Barber. If you could state your institution. Oh, Patty. Um, where I'm jointly advised by Al Crosby. Uh, can you raise up your volume? We can barely hear you. What about now? Is this better? Yep. Okay. So my question relates to um, the, the fascinating uh, confocal fluorescence experiments that you ran, um, particularly with, with respect to temperature. So, so at 25 degrees Celsius, you propagated the crack and you had a given fluorescence intensity. Um, yeah. And then at 80 degrees Celsius, you ran the same experiment and the fluorescence intensity was uh, diminished, much more attenuated. Um, so, Obviously, uh, uh, can play a significant role there. Um, but also, is there has anybody run a control experiment on the on the um, on the mechanophore itself? Does it does it have a shift in fluorescence, or is there a change in the uh, degradation mechanism as a function of temperature that may also contribute to that change in fluorescence? Oh, okay, so first of all, I mean, maybe I wasn't very clear in the, the way I did the experiment. So the, the fracture experiments are done at 80 degrees. The fluorescence observations are all done at room temperature. So there is no emission of fluorescence at 80 degrees. There is a bond scission at 80 degrees, but the fluorescence is at room temperature. Now, uh, what we try to do is, is precisely when we embedded our mechanophore into this multiple network. So in this case, uh, you, you fix the network structure and you stretch the extensible matrix. And uh, then you're applying a, a force, force distribution on your bonds without having any crack propagation. So you just count how many activation you have. And then we see a small effect of temperature uh, it does activate a little more when you increase from 20 to 80 degree, uh, as you would expect, because I think if you increase the temperature, probability of breaking the bond is higher, and you have a small effect due to rate. So we did check for that, uh, and we, we didn't correct specifically the data because it was a small effect, but we could have. But typically, if you increase the temperature, if you just take the bond, the bond will break a little bit more easily. 
at a lower force. I see. Thank you. Those are two different words. That is Sri Lankan. That is English. Li Li Hua, I think、uh, if you could mute. Thank you. Um. So, uh, for everyone on the panel, if you want to ask question, you can raise hand. And if you don't know how to raise hand, you can just physically raise hand, and I'll put you in the queue. Um. So next,、uh, we have、uh, Chelsea Davis. Let's see if my mic is working now. Can you hear me? Cool. Yeah. Hi,、uh, hi, Costantino. Thank you. Hi, Chelsea. It's so, it's so cool to see how this research has progressed over the past couple of years.、Um, so thank you for sharing that. If we could, can we go back to I guess the first experiment, the experiment、um, that I think of as Josh's experiment, but Injun and Josh's Injun and Josh's experiment. Yes, the 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 color change. Exactly, where you're using the red and green channel signals to calibrate,、yes. yeah,、um, and then track that and map that to the stress. So what I've been thinking about in some of my experiments lately is, what is that stress? Like we've always just been sort of hand wavy and say nominal stress, and not really associating. Is it stress in the tension direction? Is it a hydrostatic stress? Is it some Stress invariant. I may be wrong. Can comment on this too, but I've just been thinking about what is that stress that we're using. Yeah, it's.、Uh, I think what what we are measuring is the activation, the concentration of activated molecule. So for sure,、uh, it's the number of molecule that have seen that particular force. So when they、right. see a, they see a force higher than a certain level, they activate, and then、uh, the what we're seeing is the The increase in concentration, so that's that's definitely the experiment. Now, indeed, if we look at uniaxial tension, because it's a concentration of molecule and the molecule are in the chain, so the, probably you activate only in the tensile direction. So if you do that, then、uh, it's the number of molecules per unit area that matters, and not so much the、uh, the the actual volume, the the surface per unit, the 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 area of the material. So to me. It's kind of logical that、uh, it is the, the nominal stress and not the true stress because the nominal stress, the number of molecules that cross a plane, is not changing with extension. They just get closer together, but they don't really.、Uh, the number doesn't change. So to me, in uniaxial extension, it makes sense. Now, if you start looking in 3D, so arbitrary、uh, loading, then you're right. I mean,、uh, what are we measuring? I think the 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 stress along the principal direction is a reasonable hypothesis. This is what、uh, we are doing in the paper, and that was the idea wrong. But I think it would need validation with more complex, because basically tensile、uh, a crack、uh, in this kind of material is almost tensile, so it's very close to tensile. So it's not a very strong validation. So, but if we had a more complex loading. Uh, then、uh, there might be a, an experiment to do that would validate what we are actually measuring, and and there are some good questions there. I mean,、uh, I think indeed、uh, we 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 don't know everything. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, and、uh, I will invite Professor Hugh Brown to ask the next question.、Oh, thank you.、Um, Fascinating talk, Costantino. The what really struck me was the notion that the the image I've always had on a simple network of one plane of broken bonds and viscoelastic deformation outside that is just plain wrong. We've got to visualize lots of bonds breaking away from that plane, as you've shown. Yeah. How should we visualize them getting loaded? What what does viscoelasticity do? In can one model the way viscoelasticity will cause the load further away that can then break these bonds?、Mm, yeah, it's you know initially because I'm a molecular person,、uh, my vision of the problem was. It's the viscoelasticity changes the probability of breaking the bond. Somehow, I have some friction, 
then I really tried to reason along that idea, which was really more a molecular effect. Somehow the viscous environment has an effect on the probability. And then uh, Jean Conté, the postdoc who came to work with me, he looked at both person's paper and said, no, it, I think it's a question of uh, just increasing the strain. Your, your, your material uh, needs to, the crack needs to open more. So the, the deformation field is, you deform more, so you have a higher probability. It's not really a local effect. And then, uh, yeah, I, it took me a while to be convinced because I was pretty sure, of course, of being right. But he convinced me in the end. And we did these experiments with the multiple network where we, we, uh, we were pulling now uh, in uniaxial extension uh, with the mechanophore into a viscous environment at different rates and temperature, but no longer in a crack propagation uh, geometry, just a, a single extension. And in this case, there was not that much effect. Uh, certainly the viscous, uh, the, the rate, yeah, the probability of breaking was independent of rate. So, so now yeah, I have a picture that uh, there is a coupling indeed between viscoelasticity and bond breakage, but it's more than the, the viscoelastic behavior forces you to open the crack more to, to actually propagate it at a given velocity. And then this, this, the strain field uh, goes to higher value of strain and then the probability of breaking is higher. That's I think it's a, it's a more plausible explanation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so next, I would invite a Keith Storm. Thank you. Hey, Costantino, terrific talk, a beautiful hey, story as always. Um, my question is about part two, which I think is mostly Juliette's uh, work. And I wanna uh, briefly revisit what you call the strong hypothesis namely that the ratio of activated mechanophore to total mechanophore is equal to the ratio of broken chains to total chains. Now, I have two questions about that. The first one is that I, I don't think in a picture where bond scission is a stochastic process and the load is shared among many bonds, as soon as you have a system where you have weak bonds and strong bonds, I don't think that can be true. And we did a couple of simulations on a simple model that show in fact that that ratio uh, depends not only on the strain that you apply, but it depends also on time. So if you apply a constant load, then you see this ratio evolve to something asymptotic, but it takes uh -huh. some time. And the second aspect that I think should feature into that relates more to the, the system that you study when it fractures, um, which is the possibility that in a heterogeneous material like this, where you have weaker and stronger bonds, that the fracture uh, tip will seek out a path of least resistance, so to say. So it will not be sampling the material in any random type of way, but rather will be picking out a path where it's encountering mostly the weaker bonds. So I'm just wondering if you've thought about these aspects and how exactly you interpret the sort of fidelity of your mechanophore to report on the overall uh, damage or bond scission in your, in your material, the part that you can't see really. Yeah, I think I think when you come to really the crack plane, because I mean, basically what we are seeing is a bond scission over microns. So uh, uh, pretty far from the, 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 the actual uh, crack plane where, where you have the, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the interface and the crack surface. So, and I think we, we for sure need to break uh, some bonds directly at the interface, whether at the interface itself, we're breaking preferentially uh, the weaker bonds. That may be. I mean, I, I think that there is a point where clearly th there must make there, there must be a difference. I think when you get to a, a, a very damaged region, I, I can imagine that the crack will take a path of of least resistance. Uh, it does. I mean, the only thing that I can say is that. The, the experiment we did, which uh, convinced us, uh, is this question of we, we varied the concentration of mechanophore uh, in the as crosslinker. So in the experiment you saw, we had five percent mechanophore, uh, and we did uh, experiments with ten percent, uh, and or I think ten percent was the baseline. We did five percent and twenty percent, and uh, if we look at the uh, at the signal and we normalize by the initial concentration, 
we get pretty much the same result. So it doesn't look like there is preferential uh, breakage of the mechanophore. Because if you, if you really had a preference, then the, the more, uh, it, it would be nonlinear, the more you add mechanophore and the more signal relative to the initial concentration. And we don't really see that. Uh, we didn't go to very high. So if, if we go to 100% mechanophore, uh, of course, uh, there, there might be a, a preference relative to total bond, but it would be difficult to, to, to verify. The, the only thing I can say is that if you look at the mechanical property themselves, uh, that was a, a question from a concern of one of the reviewers. Uh, they are indistinguishable within experimental reproducibility. So if I take three networks without mechanophore, three networks with mechanophore, and I compare the mechanical property, they, they are all pretty much the same within the reproducibility of our experiment. Uh, and the activation seems to be within this range of concentration, uh, concentration independent. So these two results makes me think that it's fairly representative. Uh, but I think it remains an open question and there has to be a limit. I mean, if you bring a, if the mechanophore becomes much weaker uh, than the covalent bond, then there has to be a preference. Uh, if we have too much mechanophore, there has to be an effect. So I think uh, we, we may be in a sweet spot with a slightly right. weaker. Uh, I think having a slightly weaker means that if you stretch one of these strands, you will break the mechanophore preferentially. So this is a good yeah. thing because then you're detecting strands. If it had the same Precisely. strength, then uh, it would not be very good. Um, no, well, I think actually the, the fidelity of reporting would become ideal if they had the same strength, because then they would be breaking at exactly the same rate, regardless yeah, but, of what loading protocol That is, that is true, but, uh, but that would also mean that you could break anywhere along the chain. Exactly. So, so there's other reasons for doing this. So there would what be, I'm uh, suggesting yeah. is that I, I think we're seeing so, some evidence that uh, it certainly depends on the strain, what this ratio is. And since that is is dissipated as you move away further from the crack tip, you may be looking at a different ratio if you look further into your sample ah, okay. where you're seeing yeah, the bond yeah. breaking further away. And I'd love to explore that with you. I can share yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you, uh, yeah. I see, I see your point. Sometime. Yeah. All right. Okay. Terrific talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, Professor Yu Lan Chen. Does okay hear me? Yes. So, so thank you, Constantino, for your nice talk. I'm so impressed with uh, your talk. Uh, it seems that we have so many new results after we met each other last year in Nanjing. So uh, you have uh, done lots of work in, with uh, uh, transparent and homo, uh, homogeneous networks. Then have you ever think about or try to uh, move to heterogeneous networks or non-transparent networks? Ah, uh, of course, non-transparent would be, would be interesting, but, or at least uh, not very transparent. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've played a little bit. So you, you can, to a certain extent, reduce uh, transparency uh, because you don't need to go very deep. So, so if, you, if you can go in uh, 50 micron, you can have a nice measurement, at least close to the surface. So this, we, I think it's possible. Now, uh, if you really have absorption, like carbon black, that, that uh, is, is not the right technique uh, for, for this kind of thing. Or maybe you have to go to other type of radiation. Uh, but field system, for example, if you, lose, if, you, if you don't completely lose the transparency, I think uh, we, we have tried some experiment which uh, I, I think uh, seem to think that this is doable and, yeah, and interesting. I've read, yes, I've read your paper, the PNAS paper you published last year with the yes, uh, yeah. With the theory, the but we we uh, we we tried some experiments with heterogeneous systems. So so uh, uh, I think it's possible. It's a question of having a right. You you have to have the right question in mind. So sort of, okay, what do I want to learn and uh, and then make the material for for your. Uh, for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Ron Ra, you're next. Uh, hi, uh, Constantino, that's a fascinating talk. So 
you you uh, mentioned that the, the mechanical should be interpreted as a uh, stress measurement. So uh, I want to bring up the kind of the strain measurement people usually do in, in mechanics, uh, digital image correlation. So, uh, or particle uh, based measurement, uh, Professor Sulin Zhang uh, brought up. So uh, can you share some of your insights on uh, is it is it feasible to do simultaneous uh, stress strain measurement, and uh, what are uh, the benefits of that? Because, uh, for example, uh, to address uh, Professor Hugh Brown's question of uh, characterizing risk elasticity uh, dissipation, maybe the strain measurement at a larger scale could help. So yeah, we you know with Injun we 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 tried some uh, to to combine. I think. Uh, in principle, if you use two different wavelengths, you, you could use fluorescent particles for the strain and uh, mechanophore uh, for the stress with the right kind of molecule. I think there is no impossibility. But of course, using two different molecules, then you have to make the sample. Again, you have the same question of uh, how representative and how easy it is to easy to make the sample. So there are, there are some difficulties in, in uh, let's say, finding the right system. For, for this experiment, but I think it's, uh, I don't see why it should not be doable to, to, uh, to have, you, you have, I think if you want quantification, I think in a way the, the, the strain field, uh, I think you, you basically are looking for position. So you don't really care about intensity that much of, mm -hmm. of your fluorescent particle. Now uh, for the, the uh, stress measurement, you have to measure the concentration of molecules. So then the intensity of the signal is matters. So you would have to really think about how to quantify that in a, in a more complex environment. I see. So you, it's a, a, I think you're basically measuring activated molecules in, in the, uh, the, the, the sort of mechanophore measurement is about uh, characterizing the number or the concentration, the local concentration of activated molecule, whether you do it uh, by fluorescence or a change in absorption, but you are measuring a concentration of molecules. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Anand, you have a question? Thanks, Dan. Uh, really enjoyed your talk, Constantina. So, I, my question is uh, related to uh, Chelsea's. Uh, um, I was thinking about the fact that you said that experimentally on a single molecule level, the, well, this is the first part of the talk, on, on the single molecule level, the force to activate is a, is a, is a fixed number, more or less, 200 and some piconewton. Yeah. And, then, and even, forget about the complex stress state, but even in a uniaxial stress state, you have a distribution which, which you use to calibrate. Yeah. So you emphasize, I mean, there are at least two reasons why you have a distribution. One is, there's a distribution of uh, contour lengths between any two cross links, which I think you emphasize. But there's another reason, which is that there's an orientation distribution. Of course, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mention it, but you're right. Of course, there is an orientation so distribution. Is that? I mean, can it be checked to see which one is the dominant influence here? Is it? Is it the fact that the orientation, so the things at the pole go first, and then the the ones outside go first, and then the ones outside? I mean, that that. Uh... Yeah, I I don't know uh, whether that's really easy to do because you, what what you're I mean imagine you know the two it depends where you, where are your two crossing points initially if let's say they're in the tensile direction you're stretching like this if they're detached they they stretch like that but then you would get the same probability uh, you know a short chain uh, at, at an angle will will have the same probability as a long chain uh, which is a little bit longer but is in the direction. So to separate orientation from the, the distribution of chain length and conformation will be, will be tricky, I think. And the, the, but one thing that we did not do, I have to say, and uh, this would be what, you know, as a mechanician, you probably should do, is to look at multi-axial loading. I mean, you, you look at activation under, uh, because uni-axial is nice, but I mean, uh, if you really want to understand this type of question, you need to do a, uh, Different, uh, different type of loading, uh, which is not impossible. It's again a question of, uh, of cost in terms of making, uh, making the materials uh, and, and then doing the experiment. But I think uh, that would be the way to do it. And we didn't really try that. 
Uh, we didn't try, for example, pure shear versus uniaxial, which would already give you some information right, right. On, on activation. But I think it's, uh, those, those are all good questions. Uh, when, when, when it, I think when the molecules become more available and then maybe materials become more available, some of these questions will be addressed. Thanks. Thank you. Zhigong, you want to add us some comments? Yeah. Oh, this is a, a, a question come about uh, from Hugh Brown and from Ray Huang about uh, viscoelasticity and uh, its coupling with the fracture. Now, our yeah, constant here, I'm sure you know, since 1960s, people start with this uh, bridging model. You know that, right? Bridging model. You, we, which uh, model? Many versions. Uh, uh -huh. Cohesive zone model. Oh, cohesive that, zone model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Yeah, 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 model yeah. That in 1960. But the general vision is the following. I think your work can also tie into this. General vision is the following. In order to use toughness, this idea as a material mm -hmm. property, the prerequisite, you know, this is a small scale yielding. Large yeah. region has to be elastic in order to define energy release rate. Yeah. You cannot dance yeah. around. If a majority of a place is a viscoelastic, whatever you are measuring is not a material property. It's not a material property. No, I agree. So you can dance around, do this, do that. As yeah, end, yeah, you, you, I agree. We, you can dance other. around, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people, people confuse each other. However, yeah. however, so there has been a vision on uh, and uh, practice uh, since uh, that time in 1960 on uh, Ron Long is an expert now is uh, doing computation uh, meaning I have some bridging model I have some physics in this case could be Lake Thomas mm -hmm. and then I have a background a continuum uh, viscoelasticity I just compute whatever mm -hmm. geometry I don't even compute a material property anymore Whatever oh, yeah. geometry, I compute the failure condition for you. Yeah, yeah. Some success, some success. Mm -hmm. So, so, so here's the thing uh, about a physics. Your your physicists, physics. Now, I think actually you conceded too early to bold about the effect of a viscoelasticity. It's not entirely just a bulk effect. It's not. I give you a very clear example. Clear example. Just think about uh, this. Uh, you know, uh, conventional uh, fiber epoxy composite. Yeah. Right. So remotely, this material is so stiff, viscoelasticity is totally negligible. Right. Yeah. However, you can see the interaction at a crack plane, the interaction between fiber and the local interaction is dominating. So this is uh, this a little layer epoxy doing some allow you to do some deformation allowed to right so this would corresponding to local in the polymer sense it would correspond to local in between chain interaction that's mm -hmm. crucial so do not concede to bow too early your instinct that local interaction between no. chains are crucial no, I think I think the, the low, I I uh, I was disappointed. Indeed, uh, yeah. I initially thought this was really the main reason, and then I realized no. It, yeah. Given the effect we're seeing, cannot be the main reason. But yeah. I still think there is a reason. I mean, we we actually yeah. did some fracture experiment on on double and triple on double, multiple yeah. networks, yeah. Yeah. and those results cannot be interpreted uh, only with this. Uh, bulk idea that I presented yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The, 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 there is a, a notion of, uh, of local friction, which I think we need to use. But at the moment, I'm not ready uh, to really talk about it because yeah. I think we're still missing uh, some crucial points of understanding. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think there it could be that viscosity still, I think viscosity still matters. I think in the yeah. simple network, the way I showed, Probably not. Probably it's not the main effect. But I think in these double network where you're actually freezing the structure, then the local uh, local viscosity uh, might be yeah. uh, might play a role because uh, well, this uh, uh, interplay between local uh, dissipation between chain interaction yeah. 
and also overall viscoelastic or plasticity. Yeah. That story is not told yet. No, no, no. I, I, the, the, the molecular, I mean, this dissipation at the molecular level and how it affects probability of, of breaking bonds, uh, I think it's a, it's a good topic. I think simulations, I think, should help, yeah. but you would really need realistic ones. I mean, it's yeah. not, uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a subtle effect, so it's not easy to get that from, uh, I think, even from good simulation. Yeah, thank you. This was exactly the, the sort of type of thing that Mark Robbins would have been uh, interested in doing. Can I, can yeah. I add? Uh, uh, so Ron wants to. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for bringing this up. So uh, from simulation point of view, I guess, uh, since I work on it a little bit, I know uh, there are at least the three difficulties, very large challenges as well. Uh, first one is the cohesive zone is very hard to get. Uh, yeah. It's hard. It's hard to measure. It's hard to get that from the uh, lower scale simulations. Yeah. And uh, the second difficulty is the nonlinear viscoelasticity is hard as well. It's hard. Yeah, and, because actually nonlinear viscoelasticity is not very well understood. I mean, it's really, uh, uh, I think it's, it's hard to, to, to actually model it. In the, at the continuum level, it's completely black box. People use adjustable parameters and they really don't know how to do it. And, uh, no, no, and it's not black box anymore. Aha. Uh -huh. All the machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs> and I think at the molecular level, then the details of the friction and the, it, th those are the things that, you know, where simulation use tricks. You know, if you, the molecular scale simulation use some tricks, which means that some problems they can do, some other problems, uh, <laughs> the tricks become important. And, uh, and the, there's the third challenge that I want to echo is the coupling between even the mechanics model, the coupling between cohesive zone and the bulk yeah. uh, behavior. Yeah. If the material is not elastic, there is strong coupling between the two. Yeah. Right. So, so that makes it- And that's tricky too, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's true. Okay, thank you. Wonderful discussions. Uh, we have a few questions uh, here. Uh, question from Jun Su Kim. Uh, hi, thank you, Professor Tang. Thank you, Professor Kratong, for a wonderful talk. I am Jun Su, a PhD candidate of uh, Jiyang Source Group. Uh, I have a, uh, most of my question has been answered, so I have only have one general question. Whenever I talk about fracture with layperson, they what they asked was strength. Uh, how much load it can sustain? There will be crack. Actually, layperson doesn't care how much or how many uh, internal crack exist. They only care how much load it can load. So, in terms of in in perspective of the molecular structure design, how do you think? How can we improve the strength of the elastomer, not um, plastics or not hard materials, elastomers? How can we design? the network or their molecular structures to increase the strength. But I think to, to a certain extent, some, some things have already been done, you know, uh, in, in commercial systems for the elastomers, but uh, they, they tend to involve some, some uh, uh, either heterogeneity in the material or uh, dissipative mechanisms like polyurethanes, for example, you know, polyurethanes uh, exist for a long time. You can buy them commercially. They are extremely tough and, and extensive. I mean, they, they, uh, if, you, if you look at strength, they can have very high strength, but it's a combination of uh, you know, hard and soft segments and uh, uh, the uh, self-adjusting uh, structure. But then once they, they you, if you, after a first loading, they're very elastic. You can do uh, lots of cycle with pretty good elasticity and uh, they, they uh, but they, they are very resistant towards crack propagation, they blunt they, I, we, we did some fatigue experiment. Uh, they very effectively blunt the crack. So then after that, you can do a lot of cycles. Uh, it's very difficult to break. So th there are, I, I think what is missing is a good explanation on why it works, uh, which, which then means uh, uh, you cannot really extrapolate easily. And uh, if you want to compare uh, one class of tough material with another class uh, or, or find a common uh, feature, that is still an open question. It's 
not. Uh, uh, I think it, to me there is a, a lot has to do with uh, how the material is dealing with gradients. If you start to have gradient in property, if if the if the material uh, equalizes the gradient, has a tendency of make things more homogeneous in front of gradient. It it stabilizes and then you you, you can stretch it as homogeneously as possible. When you start to localize uh, deformation because the gradient starts to be stable, then you, you break. So this question of, of the behavior of the material in front of gradient of property is, is I think, uh, a, key, uh, a key question. And we don't often look at that. We, we tend to look at homogeneous, uh, homogeneous property. But for, for example, strength, I mean, aging, if you do uh, aging, uh, for example, oxidative aging, or uh, you, you strongly modify the strength. You don't change the elastic property much, but the strength can be changed dramatically. And uh, the notch sensitivity, I don't know. I mean, it would be interesting to see whether notch sensitivity is affected by, uh, by chemical aging. But for sure, uh, chemical aging has dramatic effects on strength. And it's not very well understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, I will invite William Mars. Hey, hello. hello. <clears throat> hey, I'm Will. <laughs> um, I'm with uh, Endurica. We're a commercial outfit. Um, and we, uh, well, we do a lot of things with fracture mechanics and rubbers and so forth. But um, my, you know, my question really was, uh, by the way, great talk. I, I've been glued to my screen, uh, fascinating stuff. I was, I was especially fascinated by the ability of your methods to sort of connect with the number of chains that are breaking and how they're distributed in the volume. I, I think that's uh, really important information. Um, you know, for people who are worried about the strength or the fatigue performance of a of a rubber thing, um, have you done any work looking at um, you know what, what, so one of the parameters that we're very interested in is uh, the fatigue threshold of rubber, yes. right? Or you know, some people call that the intrinsic strength. And um, we've been using a method that was originally developed by Lake and Yo, where you use a very sharp blade to cut the rubber. Uh, to learn about its its uh, uh, intrinsic strength, um, and the idea being that um, the idea being that the, the the strength of the stress singularity at the tip of the blade is stronger than uh, the singularity that you have, say, in a, a just a cut under tension. Um, and so there's so so you you end up uh, almost directly loading the polymer chain without loading the rest of the neighbors. Um, so my question is, have you done cutting experiments and can you see that uh, with your methods? Uh -huh. Cutting experiments. So cut, uh, you, you mean cut under strain or just uh, because we all, all our notches are made with new razor blades. So the reason being that uh, uh, we found that if you, if you use a new razor blade, you can minimize the activation of the mechanophore. Because you have to think that if you if you introduce a notch into a mechanophore loaded sample, uh, you're seeing the damage from from, from the cutting. So uh, we have introduced, uh, I think, with new blades, you you can almost have negligible uh, activation. But we did not uh, use, uh, let's say, the, the the mechanophore to understand cutting, which I think it would be a, a very good uh, problem. I mean, uh, we. We did not try to do this, but I think uh, indeed it's a uh, it's a question which is important, uh, where the the mechanics understanding of it, uh, you know, what, what's the importance of the sharpness of the blade or uh, the pressure uh, on things like elastomer. There's still good open question. At least you don't find the answer in the literature. Yeah, the, I mean the core the core idea being that if you if you can cut the blade or if you if you can cut the rubber with with uh, Without inducing a process zone or, or minimizing the process zone, yeah. then then you've got a way to sort of separate, you know, how much of my strength is coming from viscoelastic things and how much is coming from the strength of the network itself. Yeah, I think that's the idea of you know the cutting experiment. I think uh, uh, I've seen some some nice experiments, uh, we, which is something that we could in principle uh, uh, do. I, 
but yeah, we haven't we haven't done that. We've done fatigue, but not uh, not the cutting. Cool. Thank you. Fascinating work. You're welcome. Yeah. Th Thank you very much. Um, Jason Steck. Hi. Hey, uh, Professor Croton. Uh, thank you for the uh, fascinating talk. Um, and my name is Jason Stack. I'm a PhD candidate in Dragong Swo's group at Harvard. Um, and really, I have uh, one question, one comment. Um, you talked about the, uh, the Gaussian distribution of chain length within the network. And my question then is, could you use your method to actually measure this distribution of chain length and quantify what uh, at least we've referred to in our group as network imperfection? Like, uh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, um, and going back to what Jinsu asked, we know that the, uh, this distribution of chain lengths has a very significant effect on say the strength of the network. Like how many chains will be active mm -hmm. at one time? Yeah. Uh, have you done this? <laughs> no, we. Uh, I, I've thought of it because it's true. What, basically, you're, you, what you're measuring is an activation, probably in, in some of these experiments. You really, uh, particularly in the in these uh, multiple network, you're, you're looking at activation, probably. So uh, you should get some distribution, some effect. I think you uh, you had thought about that problem, Hugh Brown, uh, on on how to extract uh, molecular information. Uh, from macroscopic tests, because in the end you're you're getting some averaging, and you're you're assuming that uh, your molecules are not really connected with one another; they're all individual, uh, and you're you're looking at the distribution of, of your population. Um, we did not uh, really spend enough time on it. We 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 dabble with it and said, oh, that must be when when we try to compare. Um, our experimental results with uh, a reasonable random distribution, it was not exactly coming right. I mean, the, 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 the activation uh, was, was not matching exactly what you would have expected from, uh, let's say, just randomness of the reaction. But it could be, first of all, because your reaction was not random. So maybe your, your mechanophore experiment is correct, but uh, your chemistry did not Come with happen, or it could be that we're missing something on the on the uh, going from from let's say network to microscopic. I think to me the the reservation I have, uh, but it's a discussion we had also with jumping bone. Uh, it, you know, extracting the tensile force of a chain uh, from an average of uh, you know a material property where all chains are connected with each other through a network is the same as, as ignoring the crosslink points. You're assuming that you have all these chains. They have a certain length distribution. They all stretch independently. They, they're not connected with each other. And we measure an average. And so we get that information. In small deformation, I'm happy with that. I mean, I, I think it's reasonable. In large deformation, which is where we are, where we start looking at uh, activation, can you really ignore the connection between the chains? Um, I don't know. I, I'm uh, I'm a little bit skeptical, but I you know some some results really seem to work very well. I've seen results in the jumping gongs group on gels, where you really look at the microscopic measurement and you look at what you would expect from single molecule, and you get the same thing. And uh, the distribution is a similar thing. I mean, you you. I think you definitely should get some information. I'm not sure I would really trust it, you know. And, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it's it's just my intuition. Uh, thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, going back to, uh, I guess, Professor Brown's question and uh, what Joe Gong was mentioning, is that uh, this physical physical elasticity seems to me to be causing stress delocalization from the uh, crack tip in the same way that fibers would be causing de stress delocalization uh, in a fiber reinforced composite. Because if, uh, if you say that for the chain to break, you have to apply a force, uh, which you measured, 
then for chains to break off of the crack plane, then this stress needs to be uh, uh, delocalized off of the crack plane. Um, uh, this is interesting. Yeah, it, it's a way, no, I, I agree. It's a way to, it's a way to, it's a little bit like the chicken and the egg. I mean, the, the visco, to me, I tend to see, okay, viscoelasticity, it, it's an energy cost. If you want to grow your crack, there is an energy cost of moving this crack. And that cost is actually far from the crack tip. But to be able to actually have the energy sink, you know, the, the, the supply of energy, you need to open the crack. Uh, and and uh, so it's a way of delocalizing. I'm, I'm, but it's still a bit different than saying, for example, I'm putting nanoparticles. If I put nanoparticles, I introduce high stresses in the bulk. Uh, and so I, I magnify the chances of, of damage in the material. And, and I do it further away. So I'm activating damage at lower average stress or, or, or lower average strain. I, I think it's thinking of strain is probably better. Okay. So it's, this is introducing heterogeneities and then you delocalize the damage. But indeed, you, you could see it. I, I, I'm, not, uh, you know, I'm not against your, your vision of delocalizing. Okay. I, I mean, basically, you don't want all the damage being localized right at the, in the crack plane because then there's not much damage there. I mean, you don't need much energy to grow a crack uh, just at the interface. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, maybe I'll just add a comment there. Uh, and Ron knows this, that we, uh, we built a model, a kinetic model to um, try to get the distribution, the chain length distribution from the light emission data from Costantino's labs. And we, so this is just one data point uh, for the multi-network elastomer that uh, was mm. synthesized in his lab. But we basically built a kinetic model to describe the chain, yeah. which are breaking. And then and we were able to generate a nice fit. <laughs> but how general this can be, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you can get the distribution for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll call the next um, uh, question uh, from Pritika Karno. Uh, hi. Hey, hello. Hi, Constantine. Thank you for your talk. It was really nice and very thought-provoking. Uh, I am Pritika Karnal. I work in Johns Hopkins University with Dr. Frischet. Um, I'm ah. actually curious about, um, so you shared the schematic between uh, low velocity debonding and high velocity debonding. And I'm kind of curious because the way you showed the higher deformation in the zone, um, it kind of, um, it kind of reminded me that like with a lower cross-linking polymer, which would be softer, you would see some like similar attributes. So I'm kind of curious about what your thoughts are on like how similar the effect of higher velocity versus lower cross-linking is for fracture. Hmm. I, I think there are two different things. I mean, the, the, because the, the higher velocity introduces I think higher friction. In general, you have higher friction and this higher friction then causes a change in crack shape. But the cross-linking, uh, changing the cross-link density changes the distribution of chain length. So, so the probability of breaking changes uh, you, because you have more uh, ex extensible. In a way, your chains are more extensible. You have less, uh, cro less crossing point, less chains in your network. Uh, so the scission is really changed relative to friction. Friction is the same. It's the same monomer, same TG. So you have the same friction, but the breaking probability is mm -hmm. different. So the coupling is actually a much harder problem than I thought. Uh, in, in the Lake and Thomas model, it looks like it's simple. And it's one of the best results of the model. The scaling uh, with crossing density in the Lake Thomas model works pretty well. I mean, it, it, there is a a number of experimental systems also in gels and it really works well so it must be right i mean the, the i i believe but i think uh finding out why uh is is not uh, we we initially thought we should be able to find it i showed you some results 
they don't solve the problem. They, they say, okay, uh, we, we reproduce the experiment that everyone is doing, so it's higher fracture energy for less crossing. Uh, we see less bond scission, so the bond scission becomes less important. I mean, the picture I, I would have for elastomer is that uh, we the, the, the bond scission is less, uh, but the fracture energy is higher. So that suggests to me that the viscoelastic part is affected by the network. So, so not the friction at the monomer level, but the viscoelastic dissipation of a less crosslink material is generally higher in a crack propagation mm -hmm. event. And this is the main effect. It's not really the bond scission. And, and if that's true, it's, uh, it, it looks like two, two effects that uh, counterbalance each other. Somehow uh, uh, you, you, you break less uh, chains, but it's not really the energy of the chain. Because the energy of the chain is lower, uh, or it's about the same, but it's more the viscoelastic contribution which is higher. Because we mm -hmm. try to compare the 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 bond scission contribution of the two crosslinks, and I didn't show you that particular graph, but it's on top of each other, because the 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 less crosslinked one has less chain breakage, but the chains are longer. So if you look at the energy losing Lake and Thomas, it's about the same. So it doesn't explain why the fracture energy is high. So somehow it okay. looks more like a viscoelastic effect. But we only have two points. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you. And uh, Professor Mayumi Kuichi. Yes. Uh, hello, Constantino. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. And uh, so you, you show the distribution of end to end distance between the, uh, of the pa partial chains and the distribution change with the deformation. And uh, above a critical value of R over R max, uh, the, the chain breaks. And uh, what is the critical value of R over R max? I mean, uh, may maybe it related to the bond strength of uh, yeah this is uh, this is an interesting question because uh, of course in principle if you want to break the bond if, if you think of purely mechanical term you are stretching mm -hmm. the chain you need to fully stretch it before you can break the bond mm -hmm. but of course the chain fluctuates and it's a probabilistic event so I'm not sure whether it really needs to be fully stretched to, to break with a, a decent probability. Uh, and the, the question is, I think more uh, where, I mean, how, I, I, how, <laughs> how to, let's say, how to yeah. estimate the energy that you're actually losing when you break. I think it should break when it's close to fully stretched. You I mean uh, that, makes it, sense. that the critical <clears throat> body should be uh, close to one? You mean the Fully uh, the, yeah, fully. Well, if uh, you mean uh, R, you mean R over uh, over R the, the fully extended length. Uh -huh. That was your question. Yeah, I would think close to one uh, before you can actually. Uh, at least it's consistent with our results because it looks like we are breaking chains when they get close to fully stretched. Whether they have a mechanophore or not, uh, it doesn't look to be so important. So when you get to the strain hardening regime. This is where the when the probability of breaking becomes uh, non non zero. So then you have a, at least in normal condition at room temperature. Because for example, the the mechanophore, <laughs> even though it's weaker, but if you mm -hmm. leave the sample yeah. in your drawer uh, mm -hmm. at room temperature, it will never activate. At least within the lifetime of the PhD, uh, you you don't really activate at room temperature. So it doesn't break by itself. Now, we did not do experiments, let's say, where you stretch 50% uh, and wait. I think it, it, there should be a non-zero probability, because uh, otherwise there would be no fatigue you know, or no, uh, no breakage over time. But this, this is another question that we, we are thinking of looking at, which is the time-dependent breakage. I mean, you stretch, and then you wait. And there will be some probability of bond breakage, so now uh, how does that lead into defects and in the end of, of breakage? You have to find the right uh, window to do that experiment because you don't want to wait six months for one mm -hmm. result. Mm -hmm. But if it breaks in 10 minutes, it's probably not good either. 
so but but uh, i think this is a good you know one this kind of questions i think uh, are completely valid okay but i think uh, uh, yeah. my my thinking is more that there will be even at moderate stretch mm -hmm. uh, there will be some chains that are very close to full stretch and and they will over time they will have a probability of breaking mm -hmm. that would be the it's hard to know Okay, and, and another question is, uh, thank you. And another question is about the uh, viscoelastic dissipation zone. So, the, I mean, uh, yeah, what is a dissipation zone? So if we can measure the local, for example, tangent delta at uh, each material point, and uh, if we can map the tangent, local tangent delta, uh, is it helpful to determine the dissipation zone? I think this really is what people were doing with the conventional model, like Bo person, uh, mm -hmm. using the tangent delta and then <clears throat> introducing the tangent delta into a mechanical model and calculate the local dissipation. Uh, but then you you get the right trends, but not the right numbers. So typically mm -hmm. you're missing in the absolute value of the dissipation when you do that. But I think people have done it. They they have used the the, the G prime G double prime data. To, of course, it's a question of frequency range. You cannot do it over all frequency, but uh, uh, it's a bit, you know, what Ko Okumura is trying to do as well. I mean, mm -hmm. he's using the, the the whole viscosity and tries to explain uh, his uh, viscoelastic behavior in crack propagation only from G prime and G double prime, mm -hmm. but ignoring bond breakage, which is why I don't agree with him. Okay, okay. So you, your dissipation zone is not the same as uh, the linear viscoelastic dissipation. Uh, I think uh, I think linear viscoelastic dissipation is there for sure. Mm -hmm. You 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 have it uh, over the whole sample, but it's not the only dissipative mm -hmm. mechanism. I think when you go to very large strain, you probably have non-linear viscoelastic dissipation, mm -hmm. and you have bond scission. So these are additional mechanisms. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have a question from Professor Jin Jia. Uh, thank you, Professor Tang. This is Jin Jia from Zhejiang University. So Professor Kratten visited my uh, department in 2018, if I remember correctly, and yes, uh, also gave a talk. Uh, I was in the audience of that talk. Uh, yeah, the method you uh, presented to visualize the high tensile stress during loading is very fascinating. So. I'm wondering uh, if it is possible to use this method to visualize the self-healing process of some self-healing polymers. So for example, uh, for some self-healing polymers, the broken chains can migrate to, to reform the uh, topological entanglement with other chains. So in this case, can we see the, the movement of the, the fluorescence? And, uh, and also in some, some other uh, self-healing polymers, heal themselves by uh, reforming the, the, the bonds. So will we see the disappearance of the fluorescence during this, is the, this process? Thank uh, you. Yeah. OK, I, I see what, you, your, what your question is. Indeed, I think you could use fluorescent tools to look at this type of healing, of molecular healing. But uh, the, you need to find the right molecule. I think for this kind of experiment, because the molecule I was showing will not heal spontaneously. So if you at, at room temperature, uh, if it's broken, it's broken. It will stay broken for a pretty long time. So uh, uh, it will not. Uh, you need to heat it if you want to to have a healing. At 150 degree, you could have. Uh, I think maybe Yulan is still here. Maybe she can uh, comment. But I think this this other reaction becomes uh, reversible at high temperature, but uh, at, at room temperature, not. So you would have to use something different. But okay, I, the idea you. of taking yeah. taking a, a healing uh, system where uh, when it's broken, it's fluorescent, and when it reforms, it stops being fluorescent. I think that's a, that idea maybe you can you can use. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Discuss with you, Lan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, for some self-healing polymers, it doesn't require the bonds to reform. It's it heal itself by the the migration of diffusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in that, that case, uh, 
Can we see the change of the fluorescence? I see. Yeah, I, uh, if you pick the right type of molecule, I mean, if you break on one side or if you have, you know, fluorescence on one side and then you bring them together and you want to see a diffusion of fluorescent molecule, I think, of course, you could do something like that. I don't think you need these molecules, but uh, yeah, they, they are still fluorescent group. I think the, the, if you attach this anthracene, I mean, the, the pi extended anthracene has a very strong stable fluorescence. So if you attach that to a migrating molecule, it can be used as a probe for, for diffusion. I think people have not done that, but uh, I don't see why not. It's more the synthetic part. You need to attach it. Thank you. Uh, Yulan, do you have anything to add? Your name was mentioned by um, so, so I think, uh, so the current uh, mechanical for the fluorescence, mechanical for all chemiluminescent mechanical force, they are not uh, uh, reversible uh, at uh, room temperature or at, at, mild temper at mild conditions. So it's difficult to use uh, the current mechanical force. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, like Costantino said, it's possible to use if we can uh, find a proper uh, mechanical force. And uh, our group also trying to uh, this uh, topic. Uh, I, I hope we will have uh, more results in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And we have just one hand up, uh, Sami Hassan. Yes, hi, I'm a student in Jigong's group. Um, this was a great talk, Professor Kriton. So a lot of my questions were, were answered. So I just had some thoughts. Um, so we always focus a lot on toughness and toughness is meaningful when our crack is larger than a fractal cohesive length. Um, but you know, um, as long as our crack is less than the fractal cohesive length, then should we really just focus on crack nucleation? Uh, because- No, as, I think I agree. Hmm? As long as it's not larger, then we really don't care about toughness so much. So it's more of a general, question as uh, future research. We focus so much on toughness. Yeah. How about nuclear? No, no, it's a very good point. I mean, I've seen all the work uh, on the on this uh, uh, fractal cohesive length that uh, has been done in Zhigang's group. And I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, uh, many of these soft materials have pretty long uh, length mm -hmm. and, uh, and have pretty uh, stable and reproducible uh, strength. So, so somehow there is a question there. What, what, what controls the strength? How does uh, defects nucleate? And I think uh, it's a hard question. That's all I can say. But uh, but I think it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. We yeah. found that you have a sharp too. Kurtang, you have a sharp too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think we we are looking right now. We we have a project uh, on cavitation. So in this case, we really have a geometry where nucleation is the problem because you have no no crack, no, uh, and we, we want to see whether we can learn something about nucleation of cavities from, from our mechanical. We will see how, uh, how it goes. Keep, keep posted. Thank you. Um, Chigang, do you think this is about time? It's, uh, it's, it's one, <laughs> past one. Yeah, uh, of course, you're the, you're the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you, uh, you're well, still awake. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, just amazed I'm still awake. That's the only reason why I'm here. I mean, I think, <laughs> but it's been fascinating. So, yeah, yeah. it's kept me awake. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was nice having you. <laughs> yeah, thank really you. Really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah well. Normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he told me he, he got up the, to ride the bicycle, a bus cycling every morning, five o'clock, something like yeah, that. About that. Yeah, it's yeah. almost time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, not, not tomorrow, not this day. Not this day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, Constantino for um, this wonderful talk. It's amazing and uh, triggered a lot of uh, interesting discussions. So I thank the panel, uh, the audience for the discussion. And uh, last but not least, Jigan, the EML uh, for organizing this, uh, this fantastic 
seminar a webinar series. So thank you, thank yeah, you. It's a great, it's a great experience. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think having so many people asking questions from different, uh, it's but it's even better than being in a conference because people in a conference they have a strict timing. They cannot, uh, you know, you cannot ask that many questions. Even in a Gordon conference, you cannot ask yeah. that many questions. Yeah. 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 Thank you, uh, Jen, for organizing so many great people. Even right now, Hugh Brown is here. I cannot believe he is here. <laughs> he's here. Yeah, well, it's, it's Constantino. I, as I said, everybody lo loves Constantino, loves his talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> but Thank it's you. it's really good to see uh, friends here. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's been a while. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess people can just leave when they feel like. Yeah, right. Thank okay. you again very much. All right. And uh, Thank you. I hope I'll see you in person, not in not such a distant future, even though, uh, you know, it's okay <laughs> by Zoom, but it's nice to travel. I like to travel. <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye.